The Prophecy Club, a nationwide television program, a nationwide radio program. The Prophecy Club also hosts approximately 40 major city meetings per month. Our mission is to inform Christians of current events that confirm Bible prophecy, expose the evil devices of Satan, warn believers what is coming to America, challenge people to stop sinning and turn to Jesus with all their heart and to provide a platform for Christian speakers to be heard. It's a bald-faced lie. Using the positions of power and authority in our own government. The greatest oil field in the world is at the southwest end of the Dead Sea. He said, son, you must warn this nation. And now your host for the Prophecy Club, Stan Johnson. Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Well, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 2, says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and today we're going to be talking about probably the fulfillment to a large degree of part of that. Our topic today is, what is wrong with Mormonism? Your speaker was a professional theology teacher for the Mormon church, an elders quorum president, which he'll explain, and a temple Mormon. He was a member of the Mormon church for five years. Bill says that Mormons believe in another Jesus, another gospel, and another eschatology. He exposes the historical errors of the Mormon church, the errors of Joseph Smith, their errors of salvation, errors of inerrancy, and the Book of Mormon, that Joseph Smith was a Mason and a warlock. Will you help me welcome Bill Snebland? <laughs> well, praise the Lord. It is certainly good to be here. Um, that uh, really says it all, but uh, there's a lot more to unpack in that brief introduction. Um, the Mormon church is really one of the fastest growing churches in the world today, and uh, it's a formidable force, it really is. Uh, and I want to say right up front that there is much about the people of the Mormon church that is admirable. They're good people. They're lost people, but they're good people, and they, they have a lot of what they're doing right. And I hate to say it, but in some cases, they do put many Christian churches to shame, especially in terms of how they take care of their people, in, in terms of physical needs and so on. Um, a lot of you who are seeing this video know something in my background, and you might wonder, well, how on earth did somebody like me, who used to be a witch and a Satanist and a, all this kind of weird stuff, how did I ever join such a white bread, square, picket fence, all-American kind of wholesome leave-it-to-beaver church like the Mormon church? And I wanted to address that real quickly before we actually get into the meat of the program. What happened? How did I end up there? But before I start, there is one Bible uh, passage that I think describes the LDS Church, which is another name for the Mormons. The, their official name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And so for short, they say the LDS Church. That's not LSD, that's LDS. Although I think Joseph Smith might have been on some LSD when he wrote some of his doctrines down. But anyhow, um, in Romans 10, which uh, of course contains the heart of the gospel, many people say, but in the first few verses, there's a passage that could very easily be ascribed to the people in the LDS Church, uh, especially since they believe they are Israel. You need to know that up front in terms of Bible prophecy. They believe they are Israel. They do not believe the Jewish people are Israel. Uh, they don't believe that the Gentile church is Israel. And here's what Paul says. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 
And this is the Mormons. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And to that I can say a hearty amen. Now, how did I get into all of this? Well, I came into the LDS church a little bit differently than, than most people do. Uh, I had a hearty recommendation of the church by the Grand Master Druid of North America back in 1973. He told me that I should join the Mormon church if I ever got into any kind of deep spiritual trouble. And so that's what I did. I was in the moment of a spiritual crisis in my life. Everything was falling apart around me. And I prayed to Lucifer, this was in 1980, and asked him for a sign. Now, you know, you're not supposed to really do that. Jesus says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks, seeketh after a sign. And to make a long story short, Mormon missionaries shut up at a door within a few days. And because of what this Druid guy had told me a few years earlier, I figured, aha, this is the sign. So we virtually grabbed them by their lapels and hauled them in and said, you know, tell us how to become Mormons, which, of course, is not their usual response to knock on somebody's door. You know, and as it happened, we were... We had to go out and grocery shop at that moment. We, we, just at, we begged them to come back later, and so they did. And it was funny, even at first, in, in the Mormon church, I need to say this, they have a term they call it a, a golden moment or a golden contact. It, we call it a divine appointment. You know, when somebody, like the fish sort of jump into the boat. Well, these guys thought we were golden contacts because we were probably begging them to join, you know, which, as I said, is not typical. And, and the more questions we asked they realized we knew more about their church than they did. Because we were talking about things like, oh, you believe in a heavenly mother, right? Oh, well, we don't normally tell people that, but yes, we do. And, you know, you believe you can become gods, right? Well, yeah, we do believe that. We're taught that in the temple, but we don't really tell people that. And so anyway, they were kind of astonished at our, our zeal and our knowledge level of knowledge of, the, of what they thought were church doctrines, but actually they were druidic doctrines. And so within a few weeks, I think it was August 8th of that year, we were both baptized as Mormons. And my wife was never real crazy about this idea because, of course, she knew that Mormons are kind of repressive about women. And uh, she was afraid of how it was going to go. But she went along with it because she thought it was probably as good a place as any to hide out. And so we, we went through the first year of the church, and I was a real zealous Mormon. I I tried to give up all of my vices that I'd acquired over all those years of being a witch and a devil worshiper and everything. I stopped smoking dope. I stopped having orgies. And I was trying to be a real good little Mormon, you know. Because, you know, Mormons, their, their, their ethical code is pretty much solidly biblical. I mean, they believe in family values and chastity and, you know, they're pro-life and they're, you know, not much to argue with there. So I was trying to be, for the first time in my adult life, I was trying to be a good Christian. And I didn't realize at that time that you can't try to be a Christian any more than if you're a wolf and you can try to be a sheep. It just doesn't work. Either you are or you're not. So I was working and working and, you know, basically kind of an overachiever in everything that I do, whether spiritually or otherwise. And um, after a year, we were deemed worthy that I would receive the elders' uh, priesthood. It's See, I should explain this. In the Mormon church... Every boy over the age of 12 holds the priesthood. So, like, if you are a deacon in the Mormon church, typically you're 12 years old. Uh, and I think it's when you're 13 or 14, you become a pre. Uh, pardon me, you become a teacher. Then when you're 16, you become a priest. And this is in the, what is called the Aaronic priesthood. That's not the erroneous priesthood, it's the Aaronic priesthood, okay? Then, if you're considered worthy, and, and most young men are, when you turn 18, you become an elder. Isn't that funny? You're an 18-year-old elder. You know, you can't even shave yet, and you're an elder. But anyhow, that's how they do it. And then in, when I was in the church, they had two levels above that. They had a 70 and then a high priest. And usually you didn't get the high priesthood unless you were made a bishop or something. So I became an elder, and my wife and I went out to the Salt Lake Temple because, you know, we wanted to be married for time and all eternity. And this Druid fellow years earlier had told us that we would achieve one of the most ultimate occultic initiations inside of that Mormon temple. And so we went to that temple and we were married for time and all eternity. 
and um, bizarre ceremonies. I mean, nothing that you ever experience in the Mormon temple or in the Mormon church ever could prepare you for what happens in the Mormon temple. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But anyway, so here I am, you know, I'm in the temple, and um, we had a very interesting thing happen because both my wife and I have been given certain keywords and signs and tokens by the Druids to let people know in the church where we were at and, you know, what we knew and all that. And so by using some of those, we got an audience with one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon church. Now, this is a big deal because, you know, these are like at the very pinnacle of the Mormon church. They're right underneath the prophet. So think of them as being like the second tier on the pyramid of, of Mormon authority. And we sat down with this guy and shared with him some stuff. And he basically, he bore us his solemn testimony that the things we were telling him about Lucifer in the temple were true and that Lucifer was indeed the god of the Mormon temple. So we thought we were in the right place, you know, because here we were, you know, we were, we were basically, we'd gotten rid of most of our occult stuff except we had been led to believe that the leadership of the LDS church were some sort of sorcerers or witches. And so we felt it was still okay to be a white witch. And, um, and apparently we were right, because here this guy was telling us that Lucifer was the god of the Mormon temple, and he was one of the twelve apostles. So we went back, and ultimately I was called to be an elders quorum president. And basically that meant that I had charge of the pastor care of the ward underneath the bishop. So I would go out with some of my priesthood companions every month and visit many different families, see how they were doing. It's called home teaching. And as I did this, I discovered something. I discovered that the LDS church had a slimy underbelly that no one knew about. I discovered that there were all sorts of people in the Mormon church whose needs were not being met, who were floundering spiritually, they were floundering emotionally, they were floundering in every possible way, and the church didn't seem to have any answers for them. And one guy comes to mind. Um, I won't say his name, but he was a sweet guy. He was in his 40s, and he was a deacon. Now, mind you, most deacons in the Mormon church are 12. Why was this guy a deacon at the age of 40? Guess what? He was an adult convert, okay, which doesn't mean that much. Usually you go through the whole thing in a few months, but he smoked. Now, Mormons aren't supposed to smoke tobacco or anything else, you know. But anyway, he, <laughs> he smoked, and so he was stuck. Even though this guy loved the Lord, or what he thought was the Lord, and he was in church every time the door was open, he, could, he was damned as far as the Mormon church was concerned. He could not, because he couldn't give up smoking. I mean, we prayed for him. He prayed. He fasted. I gave him priesthood blessings. He was the sweetest guy I knew in the whole ward, and he couldn't get past these cigarettes. And if any of you have smoked, you know that's not an easy monkey to get off your back, amen? But the problem is, he, he, that meant he could never achieve the highest degree of glory. He was stuck, no matter how good his heart was. And that made me wonder, you know, why is this going on? Why can't the church, you know, because supposedly I had the power of the priesthood. I mean, why couldn't I just lay hands on this guy like, you know, Jesus would lay hands on people and poof, they'd be healed of all sorts of bizarre diseases. Why couldn't I lay hands on this guy and, and get rid of his nicotine habit, for heaven's sakes? And I talked to the bishop about it because we'd have, we'd have our PPIs. See, Mormons love all these initials. And a PPI is your personal priesthood interview. And because I was the elders quorum president, I got mine straight from the bishop, you know. And I would talk about these things. They were bothering me. And he says, he says you know, President Sneblin, he says, some of these people would almost have been better if they hadn't joined the church. Now think of that. What a statement to make. Because he says, they have all of this light, and yet they're not living up to it. And so they're damned. And, and if you understand, and we'll get into a little bit of theology later, it means that basically the Mormon church has a 90% failure rate. And I was starting to realize this. And then the other thing that happened is they called me to teach a course in the New Testament for the church educational system. And now, you've got to understand how rare this is. There aren't many people in the Mormon church who get paid to do something because all of their labor is volunteer. I mean, the, the head, their pastors, which are called bishops, are volunteer. Everybody just works for free. But I was teaching in the, what is called the church educational system, uh, which is an extension of Brigham Young University's Department of Religion. And so I actually got a paycheck, however meager. So I could say I was a professional theology teacher. That wasn't why I did it. But they wanted to, they were evaluating 
to see if I could get on the faculty and be why they had me do it. And so I taught a course in the New Testament. And you know what? For the first time in my life, now mind you, I had at this time a master's degree from a Catholic seminary, a bachelor's degree from a Catholic college. I had never read Romans. I took a course in Pauline theology at the Catholic seminary, never read Romans, never read Galatians, never read Ephesians. I didn't know what Paul was talking about. And so when I started reading this book, I realized there was no way Paul could have been a Mormon. Just no way. So I, that was bothering me. And then the fact that the church did not seem to be meeting the needs of its people were bothering me. The fact that I would go to families and visit them in home teaching, and they would tell me, you know, President Snevelin, we went to the temple. We thought it was going to be this great experience, but what we saw in that temple was so freaky. That was their words. We aren't ever going back. We aren't ever going back. And mind you, the Mormon temple experience is supposed to be the, the high point of any Mormon's experience. It's so sacred and so important that only probably one in ten Mormons ever gets to do it. So anyway, here I was in this dilemma, and basically uh, I didn't know what to do. So I started praying and fasting. And that's what you're supposed to do if you're a Mormon. The Mormons have this interesting approach to spiritual discernment. They say that if you, if you have a spiritual dilemma, you want to pray and fast. And if the answer is a true answer that you're seeking, you'll get a burning in your bosom. If it's a false answer, if the answer is no, the Lord will supposedly fall, cause a stupor to fall upon you, and you'll even forget what you were even thinking about. So either you get a heartburn or you get stupid. That's, that's your choice. And I prayed and I fasted. I really need to get an answer. And so, for various reasons, my wife and I moved back from Milwaukee to my wife's hometown of Dubuque, Iowa. And there I found a prophecy seminar flyer one day in one of the uh, local little nickel advertisers, you know. And they said they were going to talk about the truth in the book of Revelation. And I thought, well, gee, I just taught a course in the book of Revelations. Plus, I come from a church that has a living prophet. And so, therefore... I could really show these people what's, what's going on, you know. I thought I was going to steal some sheep. I didn't think of it that way, of course. But. So I went there. And mind you, this was the first time I had ever crossed swords with a guy that knew the Bible. No one had ever witnessed to me. And I was, let's see, I would have been 35 years old at this point. I didn't know what was going on. And this guy, no matter what I threw at him, he had an answer. He was slashing me alive with the sword of the Holy Spirit, which is, of course, this book. And finally, I threw the one thing at him that Mormons always use on Protestants. I said, where do you get the authority to baptize people so they can be saved? Now, why is that such an important question? Well, you see, Mormons believe there's only two possible true churches. Either the Catholics are right, and they have this unbroken line of succession, you know, all the way back to Peter the Apostle and, you know, all the way up the line, or the Mormon church is right, because the Mormon church teaches that the, the Catholic church apostatized in the 3rd century, and there was darkness for like 1,200 years. And then Joseph Smith came along and restored the gospel in its fullness and pristine wonderfulness. So, you know, if you're a Protestant, you don't have a leg to stand on, because either you're an offshoot of the Catholic church, and they cut off the branch, so you're kind of, you know, falling in the dirt, or you're not a Mormon, so therefore you have no authority. Where do you get your authority? So that was the question I raised. And you know what this guy answered me with? It was so great, because he knew my issue was nothing to do with authority. He said, where do you get the idea that you have to be baptized to be saved? It says in Acts 16.31, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And that verse went through me like a bullet through a sheet of wet tissue paper. Just, you know, went right through my magic Mormon underwear, too, I'll tell you. And um, anyway, I couldn't believe it. I was trembling. And I went home that night, and I remember my hands were shaking on the steering wheel. And I thought to myself, could it be that easy? Could it be that easy? Just believe and be saved. And so I went home, and I prayed and fasted some more, and prayed and fasted some more. And I remember a few years prior to this, before joining the Mormon Church in Vet, that I had these comic books that some, believe it or not, some Satanists had given me. They were Christian comics. And they, I remember they had in the back this thing about four steps that you can do if you want to become a born-again Christian. And I thought, well, geez, I've tried everything else, you know, practically, 
And those of you that know my story know that I virtually belong to the cult of the month club, you know. I tried everything. I thought I might as well try this. And so I rummaged around, found one of those comics. I took off my magic Mormon underwear because I didn't want any static on the line. I knelt at the foot of my bed. And, you know, just me and God here, you know. And I prayed through those four things. And you know what? Jesus Christ saved my soul at that moment. And I became born again. Hallelujah. And at that moment, I was translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And I'll tell you, I nearly went through some spiritual decompression at that moment. You know, these fish that are way down in the depths of the sea and you bring out the top and pew, they, they explode like a balloon. Well, that almost happened to me, but not quite. It was really a wonderful experience. And at that point, I felt so full of joy. I felt so full of life. It was like, you know, someone was pumping electricity through my veins, you know. And I never felt this way before in years of practicing magic and years of being this devout, hardworking, because at this time I'd been in the Mormon church over four years. And so I thought, well, maybe this is some kind of supercharged Mormonism. You know, so I went back to the Mormon church, and I was a Sunday school teacher at this new ward in Dubuque. And so I'd go into class, and, and people would say, well, how are you, brother? I'm great! Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And Mormons don't do that. I mean, you don't hear Mormons talk like that. They're all very quiet and self-spoken and, you know, they, they'll talk about how they love God and everything, but they're just very, they're not very exuberant, you know. And so people started looking at me funny. And uh, along the way, my wife discovered what had happened, and she said, she realized she'd come back to the Lord a few years, not a few years, but a few months before that, and so she realized, okay, we're back together now, you know. So we realized we were both saved, and, um, so we decided, okay, we're going here. And so we, we prayed about it. We stayed in the church a while. I, I had some conversation with various church leaders. In fact, I remember this one fellow. He was, he was my elders quorum president because I was in a new ward and had a different position. And he asked me why I was thinking of leaving the church. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. I have 32 questions about the Book of Mormon. And if you can answer me those questions, I'll stay in the church. So I asked him these 32 questions. And he couldn't answer one of them. He just could not answer one of them. And so very soon after that, I demanded a high council court, because I was an elder, and so I could get a high council court, and demanded to have my name taken off the church rolls. But because I asked for the court, I got to sit there in that court in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, the Cedar Rapids stake of the LDS church, and I got to, because once they gave me the floor, they couldn't take it away. So for three solid hours, I witnessed to them. And I, my pastor was allowed to be in the room with me as long as he didn't say anything. So he was behind me praying up a storm, I'm sure. And uh, so ultimately, you know, of course, none of them would admit I was right. But they had no answers. All they could do was say, well, I, I just want to bury you my testimony that Jesus is the Christ and Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and the Book of Mormon is true and blah, 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 you know and so at that point I went on my merry way but at that at that meeting is when God gave me a vision and I don't know if I'm spooking any of you out by saying that but I had a vision of of a sidewalk a solid sidewalk which represented the cults and all of a sudden these flowers were cracking up through the through the cement and they were like new people being saved every day out of the cults. And this is what God was calling me to do. And that was the beginning of our ministry with one accord, right then and there. That was in 1985. And about a year later, I, I started in full-time ministry. So anyhow, praise the Lord for that. Let's, let's get into now what, what's going on with the Mormon church. Um, first of all, we need to talk about where it came from. What's, what's the story? It's a quintessentially American religion. Uh, in fact, there's probably not a religion out there that is more American than Mormonism. And I say that in both the best and the worst senses of the word American, and we'll, we'll see what I mean by that in a moment. Um, how did Joseph Smith get his start? Well, <laughs> the Smith family was a peculiar family. Uh, he grew up in upstate New York at the beginning of the 19th century, a uh, rural family, and basically they were involved in, in some rather odd practices. Their, the father of the family, Joseph Smith Sr., was a full-blown occultist. He was involved in an occult group that went out and did water witching and dowsing and digging for buried treasure uh, that was called the Wood Scrape. Don't ask me why they called it that. Um, 
Mrs. Smith, Joseph's mother, uh, that that's her. I don't know how well you can see that picture. She looks kind of creepy to me. But anyway, her name was Lucy Max Smith, and she said in her autobiography that her family cast magical circles and practiced the faculty of Abrak. Now, that's from the name, the word abracadabra, you know, which is everybody knows, you know, abracadabra, it's a magic word. So that was a term that was used in that time for practicing not just this isn't just minor league occultism. This is high-level ceremonial magic. They were casting magic circles, and they were doing occult things. So anyhow, at this time, there was a revival sweeping through the area. This is, again, around Palmyra, New York. And, and I guess the Methodists were having revival meetings, and the Presbyterians were over here having revival meetings, and lots of people were getting saved. There was a great excitement. And in fact, it was so, there was so much going on spiritually, they called that area of, of the East Coast the burned over district because there were so many revivals, you know, it was like, you know, it was almost burned over with revival fire. And Joseph Smith's the story, the official story is, is that he was wondering which church to join because the Methodists were saying, join us, the Presbyterians were saying, join us, and the Methodist Episcopal Church was saying, join us. And he didn't know which church to join. Now, he supposedly had never read the Bible in his life. He was like a teenager. And they had this big old honking family Bible that was obviously gathering dust in the spider web somewhere in the Smith cupboard. And he hauled it out, and the book just happened to open to James 1. And he looked at James 1, and it says, If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Now, that sounded pretty good to him. So what he did is he went out and... Um, went to the woods and prayed. This is, this is the official story. And what happened is, first of all, he, um, he supposedly was overwhelmed with great darkness to such an extent that he thought he was going to lose his very life. It was so dark and suffocating. Then, all of a sudden, this pillar of light shone down upon him. And he saw these two glorious personages, as he called them, appearing in the light. And the one personage gestured to the other and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. I have to apologize for one. I need to go get a book that I forgot to get. So give me a second here. This is my old triple combination from when I was a Mormon. It's got the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price in it, because I want to read this verbatim. This is what they said. I, he says, I asked the personages which stood above me in the light, which of all these sects were right? For at this time I had never entered my heart that they were all wrong, and which of them I should join. And in verse 19, this is Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verse 19, I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors, in other words, the people who profess those creeds, in other words, Christians, were all corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. For they teach for doctrines the commandments of men, have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And in verse 20, it says, he again forbade me to join with any of them. That's right out of the Mormons. So realize that the Mormons believe that your church, whatever church you're going to, is an abomination. Whether you're a Baptist or a Pentecostal or a Lutheran or a Methodist, it's an abomination. And that all you are corrupt. So when they start talking about how ecumenical they are, this is right in their standard works. So anyhow, then we have the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith, later on, was given a, a vision of an angel, supposedly who appeared in his bedroom. And this angel was another glorious personage in glowing robes. And he identified himself as being the angel Moroni. Okay, now if you haven't found the angel Moroni in your Bible, don't worry, he's not in there. Uh, he, it's, it's, it's a unique name out of the Book of Mormon. And Moroni was supposedly a, a living prophet back 400 years after the time of Christ in the Americas. 
And he told Joseph Smith over the course of several visits like this that there was ancient scripture buried nearby on golden plates and that this was the story of an ancient American civilization that had existed thousands of years ago. And Joseph Smith would do the right stuff and prove himself worthy that he would get these plates. So for three separate years, on the night of the autumn equinox, this angel would appear to him, that's September 21st, and finally, the third time, he led him to where the plates were. This is all right out of the official history of the church. He dug up the plates, and then, by the gift and power of God, he translated them, because naturally these plates weren't in English. They were in a strange language called Reformed Egyptian, which, by the way, does not exist. But that's what Joseph Smith claimed. And as he brought forth this story, it was about basically, and I, I've got to keep this brief, but that the, there were some Jewish people who fled Jerusalem by boat at the time of the prophet Jeremiah, when the city was about ready to fall, okay? And they came by boat to the New World. And this was headed up by um, Lehi. And he had two sons, well, two main sons, Nephi and Laman. And Laman was kind of a stinker, and Lehi was disgusted. Pardon me, Nephi was very good. So you have kind of like the old Cain and Abel thing again. And when, when Lehi died, the, the, the descendants of Laman started getting really nasty. And the descendants of Nephi all became very righteous and good for a while. And because these Lamanites, as they came to be called, were so bad and so wicked, so evil, the Lord smote them with a dark skin. And they came to be known as what today we call the Native Americans. So that's the Mormon explanation for where the Native Americans came from, is that they're Jews that had their skin darkened because they were so loathsome and filthy and evil. Whereas the Nephites, and this is right out of the Book of Mormon, were white and delightsome. So, you know, you can see what's happening here, okay? So, anyhow, this goes on for several centuries, and there's, there's so many bizarre things in the Book of Mormon, I wouldn't even have time to go into them. But suffice it to say that in the climactic moment of the Book of Mormon is that when Jesus dies, darkness comes over the face of the new world. And after he rises from the... And I think there's this big earthquake, too, in which thousands of people are killed. And then after that, Jesus comes to the new world. He descends down in a glorified, resurrected body and starts a church in the new world. And he sets up 12, just like he had in Jerusalem, and sets up his church, just like in Jerusalem. This is how they will often portray the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ. And we tell people, no, it's a testament of another Jesus Christ, because the Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of the good book. Anyway, so... This, everything is fine for a while. The Lamanites become converted. The Nephites are all holy and righteous and white and delightsome. But then some bad stuff starts happening. There starts to be wars. And from by the time of the year 421, there's this climactic battle. And I don't know how well you can see that, but that is an old engraving of a hill in upstate New York called Hill Cumora. And this is where the final apocalyptic battle took place in the New World where over 150,000 Lamanites slaughtered a handful of Nephites. And this is, this is worse than the Battle of the Alamo, folks. I mean, this is bad. Now, the thing you've got to realize is this, this picture you're seeing there, the hill is roughly about two city blocks in size. And supposedly 150,000 people were slain on this spot. I'm amazed they had room to fall down, amen? But, I mean, because you think about it, I mean, two blocks, you know, how could you fit that many people? And then the funny thing is, is that the Mormon church has been digging around that hill for a long, long time, trying to find, and they haven't even found an arrowhead. And now, mind you, the Lamanites during this period supposedly had full armor. You know, they, they had breastplates, they had little helmets, you know, they had swords, and they haven't found any of this, ever. So in the last, just before I left the church, the Mormon church came up with an interesting explanation for this. Are you ready for this? They say that what happened is, is that this ancient battle actually took place in ancient America, down in like Mesoamerica, say Yucatan or someplace like that. But since Joseph Smith lived in upstate New York, God had to pick up Hill Cumorah 
and move it up to upstate New York for a few months so Joseph could find the plates, and then he moved it back down to Central America. Now, if you believe that, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I'm going to sell you. But anyway, uh, so that's the end of it. Now, uh, one final thing, though. Um, oops, went the wrong way. Um, at this battle, there was one surviving guy, uh, and his name was Moroni. I believe. Now, it could have been Mormon, I forget. It's either Mormon or Moroni. But those are two of the last great American prophets. I'm a little rusty at this, folks. I left this church in 1985. So, Anyhow, I think it was Moroni went and took this chronicle of all of these events, which was on these gold plates, and buried it, knowing that someday God would lead some great prophet of God to find them. Okay, And that's, that's the story behind the Book of Mormon. So Joseph had this book, and basically what he did is um, he used a peep stone, which is like a crystal ball, to translate this from Reformed Egyptian into English. He got the book published. He somehow raised the money to publish the book. And then in 1830, he started what he originally called the Church of Christ. Later on, it came to be known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, here's an interesting thing about this is that a cornerstone idea in the Mormon church is that you can't be baptized unless you have authority. Okay? I mean, unless the person who baptizes you has authority. Where does the authority come from? Well, the authority comes from the priesthood. So if you don't hold the priesthood, you can't baptize anyone. So folks, I'm sorry, all of you are not really baptized. Even though you've probably, I hope, all been baptized by immersion at some point in your life. Well, it didn't count. Because the person who baptized you did not have, the, not have the priesthood. Now, you might ask, well, how did this get started? Well, when I talk about the great baptismal charade, this is what I mean. Supposedly, on the banks of the Susquehanna River, uh, I think it was near Harmony, Pennsylvania, John the Baptist appeared to Joseph Smith and one of his uh, compatriots, I think it was Oliver Cowdery, and told them that they had to be baptized. And so he gave them instructions. And he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Joseph, you're going to baptize Oliver. And then you're going to give Oliver the priesthood. And then Oliver's going to baptize you and give you the priesthood. Now, think about this. <laughs> Where did this come from? I mean, you know, if you, you can't hold the priesthood unless you're baptized. So even though Joseph baptized Oliver, he didn't have the priesthood to do it. This is confusing. Isn't it? And then you think about it. Why didn't just John the Baptist do it? He was there. He's like the world's greatest expert on baptizing people. Amen? I mean, you'd think if anybody could know how to baptize, it would be John the Baptist. Plus, Mormons are taught that John the Baptist held the fullness of the Aaronic priesthood. He was the last great Aaronic priest. But he didn't do it. He just stood there and held his hands while, you know, Oliver's dunking Joseph and Joseph's dunking Oliver and neither one of them have the priesthood authority to do it. And on that shaky foundation, I mean, you think the Catholic Church has problems. This is the shaky foundation upon which Mormon, the Mormon priesthood and the whole idea of the Mormon, uh, you know, authority comes from. And see, this is interesting because when I was made an elder, I was given a card that I could carry around in my wallet that had my priesthood line of succession. And it told, hey, this guy ordained me an elder, and he was ordained an elder by so-and-so, and, -so and da -da 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 -da, all the way back to either Joseph Smith or one of the three witnesses. And it's all a sham. It's all a charade. Now, this is, this is one of the few pictures, engravings we have of Joseph Smith. And I, I apologize, it's just a little black and white etching. But uh, as you can see, he wasn't a particularly good-looking guy. He kind of had an interesting nose and everything. But, but he, was, he was quite a charismatic figure, apparently. And he drew a lot of people to him. But what was this guy really like? Well, first of all, was he a boaster? He most certainly was. Listen to this. This is from History of the Church. This is an official Mormon, Mormon document. It's from History. If you want to look it up, it's History of the Church, Volume 6, 408 and 409. This is what he wrote. I have more to boast of than any man ever had. I am the only man who has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. Neither Paul, nor John, nor Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. 
Now, isn't that just godly and humble and all of that? The interesting thing is, is the other thing, he claimed to be descended from Jesus Christ. See, in the inner circles of Mormonism, they are taught that Jesus was married, and that he, in fact, he was a polygamist. He had many wives. He had Mary Magdalene, he had Mary, he had Martha, he had Salome. They, they, he had this little harem that followed him around, because there's that one passage in Luke where it says that, that, that Jesus had these women that followed him and ministered to him of their substance. And they claim that means that these women were his wives. And, and so Joseph taught, I think it's in DNC, one, I should explain, when I say DNC, I'm not talking about a gynecological procedure. Uh, DNC is, is Doctrine and Covenants in Mormonese. And I believe it's in Doctrine and Covenants 113. He talks here about the fact that... Um, it says, what is the rod spoken of in the final verse of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? It is a servant in the hands of Christ who is partly descended to the house of Jesse of the house of Ephraim and upon whom there is laid such power. And then it goes on to say that it is the descendant of Joseph upon whom rightly belongs the keys of the priesthood. And later on it indicates this is, in fact, Joseph Smith. Now, was he a glass looker? Well, what's that mean? Well, a glass looker is someone who looks in uh, crystal balls. And you see that little picture up there. That is one of Joseph's peep stones. It was one of his special seer stones with which he translated the Book of Mormon. And if you read David Whitmer's An Address to All Believers in Christ by eyewitness accounts, it says that what he did is, now fi figure this, he'd have the gold plates over here underneath a blanket. He wouldn't even look at them. And he had this big stovepipe hat, you know, think Abraham Lincoln, okay? And he'd, he'd put this peep stone in the hat, and he'd put his face in the hat. And the peep stone would light up and give him the word in Reformed Egyptian, and then it would give him the word in English, okay? And then he would tell the person who was there to scribe it down, and that person would write it down. That's how the Book of Mormon was translated. Now, was he a money digger? Well, what does that mean? That's not like being a gold digger, okay? that term. But this is a money digger. And the term in those days meant someone who fraudulently would go around and sell his services to, to gullible people and claim that he could use occult powers to find buried treasure. See, now remember, this is the early part of the 19th century, and there were a lot of these old pirates that had been around maybe 50 years before that. So there are all these stories about like Blackbeard's treasure and all these different treasures. And so Joseph Smith, and he was actually convicted of this in 1828. Oh, I'm sorry, not in 1828. It was 1826. He was actually convicted in court of being a disorderly person and an imposter because he was selling his services. And this is, you know, six years after he got the Book of Mormon, mind you. And yet he was still running around claiming he defrauded people because he would claim to find buried treasure and he'd say, dig there, and he'd dig up the whole field that wasn't there. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, the evil spirits moved it. Pay me another dollar, and I'll tell you where it went, you know. So, you know, the guy, was, he was a con man. Now, what about this? Is he going to be our judge? Believe it or not, yes. The second prophet of the Mormon church taught in Journal of Discourses, Volume 7, 289. This is Brigham Young. You probably all heard of Brigham Young, if nothing else, the university. He said, no man or woman in this dispensation will ever enter the celestial kingdom of God without the consent of Joseph Smith. He will be our judge. So we got Jesus and we got Joseph to contend with now. So if you are on Joseph's good side, I'm afraid you're going to get into a lower kingdom. Okay, now here's the other thing. Was he a Methodist? Now people might say, well, what's wrong with being a Methodist? Absolutely nothing. But see, here's the deal. Eight years prior to this, Joseph Smith, and I read you the account right out of Mormon scriptures, was forbidden from joining any church. And yet, in 1828, he joined the um, Episcopal Church. Uh, pardon me, Methodist Episcopal Church. He didn't stay long. You know why? They kicked him out because he was an occultist. But here he was. He was supposedly this fledgling prophet of God who was never supposed to join any other church and he ends up joining the Methodist Church, Methodist, excuse me, Methodist Episcopal Church. Another question, 
Was he a Freemason? Yes, he was. According to the History of the Church, Volume 4, 551 and following, he got the first degree of Masonry on March 15, 1842. That was two years before his death. Then on March 16th, one day later, he got the sublime degree of a Master Mason. Masonry is, of course, a competing religion. It is, it is a, a false religion to any Christian religion. Now, another question. Did Joseph bed other men's wives? Yes, he did. See, he taught in section 132 of Doctrine and Covenants, he taught that the new and everlasting covenant of marriage abrogated all old weddings. All old marriages were null and void. And that if you wanted to be married, you would have to come to the priesthood. Okay? And so he would go around, and if he would see that your wife was particularly attractive, he would go and say, God has given me a revelation, and your wife is to become my wife. And if you didn't want to get on the bad side of the prophet of God, man, you, you let, let him have your wife. And that was the end of your marriage, basically. So when Joseph died, he had, I think, 27 wives is the last count. Okay, did he die an occultist? Well, yes, he did. Because when he was shot, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes, when he was shot, they found in his pocket, you see that funny little occult thing up there on the screen? That is a Jupiter talisman. That is a picture of the Jupiter talisman, which he had in his pocket at the time of his death. Now that Jupiter talisman is supposed to be there to give him two things. If you look it up in Francis Barrett's massive textbook, The Magus. In The Magus it is said that this particular talisman is number one, to give someone success with women, and number two, it's supposed to help you have worldly power and possessions. So it wasn't that spiritual. He wanted to get girls and he wanted to get money and power. So there we go. That's Joseph Smith. Now, what happened is, is because of a lot of these obscure teachings, Joseph Smith was run from one town to another, sometimes literally ridden out of town on a rail, or tarred and feathered. And, and he went to Kirkland, Ohio first, and there they built their first temple, but they were run out of town. Then he ultimately moved to Nauvoo, Illinois, where they started their own little city there. And Joseph Smith ruled this city like a tiny kingdom. And it wasn't that tiny, because by this time, Mormons were being converted all over the English-speaking world. And believe it or not, Nauvoo was bigger than Chicago in the 1840s. It was huge. Of course, Chicago wasn't that big either. You've got to realize that. But, um, now, at this point is when Smith became a Mason. And this is interesting, because he was made a Master Mason in March of 1842, and just a couple weeks later, on May 4th, well, actually six weeks later, he suddenly from God got this revelation for the temple endowment. Now, the temple endowment are the secret rituals of the Mormon temple, which are about 70% similar to Freemasonry. Gee, is that a coincidence or what? Anyway, well, of course, you know, God works in mysterious ways. So at that point, he began secretly teaching to a handful of his inner followers the temple endowment, as it is called. Now, in section 132, I've already alluded to this, of Doctrine and Covenants, he introduced to a handful of inner people the concept of plural marriage. And this is, of course, what most Mormons are famous for, even though they don't officially do this anymore. But listen to this. This is the beginning. This is, this is Mormon scripture, okay? Verily, thus saith the Lord unto my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired in my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord talk about verbose, have justified my servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of having many wives and concubines. Behold and lo, I am the Lord thy God, and I will answer thee as touching this matter. Therefore, prepare thy heart to receive and obey the instructions which I am about to give you. For all those who have this law revealed unto them must obey the same. Now here's the law. Behold, I reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant, and if you abide not that covenant, you are damned. For no one can reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. And then if you go on to verse 18, he say, 
you know, if you marry a wife and make a covenant with her for time and for eternity, if that covenant is not by me or my word, which is my law and is not sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise through him whom I have anointed and appointed unto him, then it is not valid neither of force, whether they are out of the world or in the world, because they are not joined by me, saith the Lord, neither by my word, when they are out of the world because they cannot be received there, because the angels and the gods are appointed there. And it says that these people will become gods because they, their seed shall have no end. And now here's the killer verse. Verse 21 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you abide my law, ye cannot attain to this glory. So what this passage, and I don't have time to read the whole thing because it's several pages long, including a passage here where Emma Smith, Joseph's wife, is commanded to accept other people, other, other wives. And Joseph's first wife was 14 years old. And at the time, he was in his, probably his late, I'd say early to mid-30s. Um, her name was Fanny Alger. And anyway, she was told that if she didn't approve of this, she was going to be in deep trouble. You know, I can imagine how fun it was to be in the Smith household for a while. So anyway, remember this, because this is important later. If you don't accept plural marriage, you're damned in the Mormon church. Okay. So, things got progressively stranger. Uh, Joseph Smith was crowned king of the USA later on in the year 1844, and he even ran for president. How many of you knew that, that Joseph Smith ran for president? Not that he was really a viable candidate, but, uh, you know, what can you say? Let's see. Um, what happened next is kind of interesting. He was incited for riot because you know what happened? A mob of people. Uh, pardon me, let me back up one step. Some people who were disaffected Mormons printed a newspaper in Nauvoo that revealed the fact that Joseph Smith had more than one wife. <gasps> this had never been revealed before, even though it was sort of like the worst kept secret in the, in the city of Nauvoo. And so Joseph ordered a mob to trash the printing press and destroy it. When the governor of the state heard about this, he had no choice but to order Joseph Smith arrested. So he was arrested, and because they knew there would be riots if they kept him in the jail at Nauvoo, because see, Joseph Smith, imagine a sinister version of Andy of, of, of Mayberry. Joseph was the mayor, he was a justice of the peace, he was the sheriff, and he was the general of the Nauvoo Legion, which was an actual army that he was raising. On top of which, he was the prophet, seer, and revelator of the Mormon church. So this guy had all the power he could possibly have in that city, so they trundled him over to Carthage Jail in Carthage, Illinois. And a couple days later, a mob stormed the jail and he was shot by the mob. There's two theories as to why he was shot. One is, is that the people that shot him, and there were several, it was a fusillade of gunfire. Um, several rifles were involved. Is that Some of them were guys whose, men he had, whose wives he had stolen, and they were upset with him. The other theory is that the fingers on the triggers of those rifles had Masonic rings on them because he had revealed secrets of masonry to people who were not masons. Uh, now, the other thing is, is that if you listen to some of the, the talk about Joseph Smith in the Mormon church, they say that he died as a martyr, that he shed his blood for us. Now, think of that. Now, the thing you've got to realize is that what, here's, here's what happened. Joseph Smith was up in the jail on the second floor and locked up, but someone had smuggled him a pistol. And, and so people broke in the, day, the jail door, and they were coming into the room after him. And he shot, and he fired two bullets and killed one guy and seriously wounded another guy. And then he realized, then the gun jammed. And so he started to climb out the window. And that's when he was shot by all these people that were out in, the, out in the square. And as he fell to earth, the official Mormon version is, is that when he landed on the ground, he laid there and he said, my Lord and my God. And then he died. Now that's not what the witnesses actually say. The witnesses actually say that as he was falling, he said, oh Lord my God, is there no help for the widow's son? Now those of you that may have heard my talk on Masonry would know that that is the grand Masonic hailing sign of distress. And it's given by a mason when they're in dire need of help. And of course he was. He was falling out of a second-story window with bullets hitting him in several places. 
But, you know, and the interesting thing is, is at that moment he was the son of a widow because his, his mother had been widowed, his father had died a few years before that. So, and, and really, we don't know to this day who actually shot Joseph Smith. But he died, and very unexpectedly. And the, then we get into the controversy. Because prior to that time, Smith had, revela- had left a revelation that his son, Joseph Smith III, would be his successor as prophet. But at the time of his death, his son was just a kid. There you see Brigham Young. He was a very forceful personality, and he was a senior apostle. And he managed, more or less by the sheer force of his will, to kind of shove Emma Smith, who was Joseph's widow, well, one of his widows, (coughs) out of the way, and basically staged a bloodless coup, and he became the new prophet. And he set the standard of succession. Because ever since that time, the, the Mormon church has been run in the way that whoever's a senior apostle, when the prophet dies, he becomes the next prophet. Now, Brigham was a really, you know, a very interesting fellow. Um, he was a good leader. He was probably, in fact, a better leader than Joseph Smith was. He didn't have a lot of Joseph Smith's character defects. Um, what happened with Emma Smith is that she took the child, Joseph Smith's son, and went off into hiding because she was afraid that Brigham might order him killed. And then later on, she started the RLDS Church, whose headquarters are not far away from here in in, uh, Springfield, Missouri. Um, So that's where the RLDS Church, the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, comes from. And it continues today uh, as as a a very small church by comparison with the um, Mormon Church. They do not call themselves Mormons, by the way. Even though they do use the Book of Mormon, they do believe Joseph Smith was a prophet, but they do not have a lot of the same weird doctrines that the Mormon church has. Now, soon after this, the Mormons were run out of town by mob violence. Their temple is burned to the ground, which they were... Oh, I should tell you this. This this picture here... Where? Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, This is a, the only, one of the few sketches we have of the Nauvoo Temple before it was destroyed. They are just now rebuilding it, and it's going to be, I think, open very soon. They have a, they're going to have a temple now in Nauvoo. If any of you want to go and have a, a special spiritual experience, you can go see it. It's just over the river there on the other side of the Mississippi. Uh, so anyhow, they're run out of town, and Brigham Young gets the inspiration to move west. And so he goes out there, and in the Salt Lake Valley, this is the famous moment. It's immortalized by a statue now in downtown Salt Lake where he stands there on the mountains and looks down at the Salt Lake Valley and says, this is the place. And that statue is there to this day, and the funny thing is is he's standing there, and his hand is out, and right in front of where his hand is is the Zion State Bank. (laughs) A lot of Mormons find that rather amusing. But anyway, um, so... They set up shop out there because they figured they were that far away from America that they wouldn't get hassled about their polygamy. So he gets the, um, the inspiration to have all of these devout Mormons that are still in Nauvoo to pack up all their belongings because they didn't have enough money to get um, wagons, covered wagons or prairie schooners or conestogas or whatever. And so they, they had hand carts. And they, they trundled across the prairie in the hand carts. And this is, if, you, if you're a Mormon and you're descended from one of these handcart pioneers, as they're called, that's one of the proudest things in your, in your family, is that you made it. Because most of them didn't. A lot of them didn't. A lot of them died in the middle of the, of the Great Plains, and, and especially as they got further west, because they had no shelter. Uh, they were attacked by Indians. They were attacked by wild animals. A lot of them were just babes in the woods. Many of them, in fact, were recent immigrants from England, you know, they didn't even speak the language. <laughs> Sorry. I, we were over in England in, in, in January and December, and it's hard to understand some English people. <laughs> anyway, they, they, so they, they, a lot of Mormon people died in the middle of the wilderness. You know, and they, even though they were trying their best, and, you know, you've got to give them credit, but they, they were following a pretty foolish council. Now, out in Utah, basically Brigham set up a kingdom out there. He ruled, like he, you know, in fact, many writers who've explored this period of Mormon history said if you want a good example of how Brigham Young ruled out there, think of Jim Jones. Think of Hitler. 
because that's basically his word was absolute law. And he had, he had his avenging angels, the Danites, people like Wild Bill Hickman, John D. Lee, and others who were gunslingers. And if you were someone like me, see, I'm an apostate Mormon. I would be killed back then. Brigham Young actually stood up in the tabernacle of the Salt Lake Tabernacle, I mean, the, the pulpit of the Salt Lake Tabernacle, and he had this big Bowie knife, and he waved it over his head to the congregation, which was packed. And he said, anybody who is, I'm not quoting directly here, anyone who is a nasty apostate, we're going to go out and we're going to slit their throats. And he waved, and everybody goes, yes, yes, go, go, you know. And, and, you know, if you were an apostate, if you were not living according to all the laws of Mormonism, your life was in danger back in those days because of the avenging angels. And it's interesting that to this day, the state of Utah is the only state in the Union that has a church police force that can arrest people. The church security system can arrest you if you're in Utah. So people joke that the Constitution is null and void when you cross the borders of Utah. Um, and I know I've had a few dealings with the church security system, and they are, are not particularly nice people. But the interesting thing is, is because, you see, many of you may know, I'm going to talk about this more later, a lot of Mormons get into the FBI, they get into the CIA, they get into government, and so most of the church security people are former Secret Service, former FBI, or former CIA. In fact, the guy that I dealt with, he had just been fired from the uh, L.A. office of the FBI as the special agent in charge because um, he, he was a victim, of, well, wasn't a victim, he was wrong, but he was the target of a lawsuit because he was refusing to promote agents of color. Hispanic agents and African-American agents were filing lawsuits against him and the FBI because, you know, Mormons have this little racist thing, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so anyhow, additionally, of course, there was a lot of oppression of women because women were expected to be married. And this usually meant polygamy because that was the law out there. And many of these women, you know, they might be, you know, 15, 16 years old and they'd be forced to marry some guy who was old enough to be their grandfather because it was a sign of status. The holier you were, the more wives you had. And I think Brigham Young, when he died, had over 50 wives. So, in fact, the joke was that toward the end of his life, he was so fat, Brigham was, that he had to be carried around in a chair by six guys, and he had barely enough energy to sit up in bed every now and then and get married. So, anyhow, uh, we talked about the Danites or the avenging angels. We already mentioned that. Now, what happens is, this became an increasing scandal in the United States. This was a big deal in 19th century politics in the 1860s, after the Civil War kind of settled down and was over and they were they'd kind of, that whole thing around the South had sort of, you know, kind of settled down. This was the next big thing the United States had to deal with. And so they had what they called the Mormon Wars, where the U.S. Army actually went into Utah and started, you know, basically driving these church leaders from pillar to post. And at one point, um, of course, this is, Brigham had been dead by now, and I think it was the, the second or third prophet after him uh, was running the show at this time. And basically, the, the two things the church wanted, A, it wanted to be left alone, B, it wanted statehood for Utah, for the territory of Utah. And the U.S. government said, no way. We are going to prosecute you guys because you're, they passed a federal law against plural marriage. And they were out there in force to enforce it. And... Um, so President Wilford Woodruff, who was the prophet at that time, he had a revelation in 1890 that this new and everlasting covenant of marriage was now abrogated. It was null and void. And now, if you're a Mormon and you have another wife, you can be excommunicated for it. For as before, if you didn't have another wife, you were damned. So, you know, it's an interesting church, wouldn't you say? So anyhow, Utah got its statehood but at the cost of its most important doctrine. And that's where the Mormon fundamentalists come from. Because to this day, there are over 35,000 polygamists in Utah. And most of them are, in fact, fundamentalist Mormons who believe that the original LDS Church of Joseph Smith has apostatized. 
and is, is out of line with God, and so they're the one true church, okay? Then we go along, and in the, in the middle 20th century, the church started to get established um, and began to move out of the fringe into the mainstream. Probably the, the two first prominent Mormons to come into the public consciousness, some of you may old enough, be old enough to remember when Ezra Taft Benson was, uh, secretary, I think was Secretary of Agriculture in the Eisenhower administration. He was a Mormon. Some others of you may remember when George Romney ran for president. He was a Mormon, and he probably lost the presidential primary because of the Mormon stands on blacks. Now, what does the Mormon stand on black people? Well, basically, in the old days, prior to 1878, black people could be baptized, but they could not hold any offices in the priesthood or anywhere else in the church. They could not go to the temple they could not be sealed for time and all eternity. You might well ask, why is this? Well, see, Mormons have this cosmology. They believe that what happened is that before the creation of the earth, there was this meeting of the gods. And yeah, Mormons are polygamous. They believe in many gods. And that there was this committee meeting to decide what to do about the earth. And Jesus raised his hand and said, I would ask that you would create all these wonderful people on earth and that I would go down there and I would show them by their, my example how to live a good life, and in this way men might be saved. Then Jesus' younger brother Lucifer raised his hand and said, I will go down and I will teach these people the gospel principles, and I will force them. I will take away their free agency, which is the Mormon term for free will, and I will force them to obey the gospel laws, and in this way I will get all the glory. Well, the council voted down Lucifer and voted for Jesus' plan. And so Lucifer got all ticked off, and he managed to talk a third of the angels of heaven into rebelling. And a third of the angels lined up behind Jesus, including the archangel Michael, who will become Adam later. There's a little secret you learn in the temple, is that the archangel Michael is actually Adam. But anyway, so there's this big fight between a third of the angels that are good and a third of the angels that are evil. And in the middle, where's the other third? Well, they sat on the sidelines and drank Coke and waited. That's not literally what they believe. But they sat on the sidelines and waited to see who would win. Now, what happened? Of course, we all know Jesus won. The devil and his angels were kicked out of heaven, and they became the demons. Okay. The, the um, angels that sat on the sidelines and did nothing... They were cursed with a black skin because of their laziness. And so they were sent to earth and, and were basically not going to ever get the priesthood until every white person on earth had gotten it. Now what about the angels that fought on the size of Jesus? Well, they would be white and delightsome. And they would come, this is, remember the Book of Mormon, you're white and delightsome, you know. <laughs> and anyhow, you go down there, and you would get to be born into Mormon families. Oh boy, what a deal, you know. And that way you can have the fullness of the everlasting gospel from when you're even a little kid. So, and, and if you read the writings of Mormon prophets like Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith, these are all like, you can probably tell, relatives of the original Joseph Smith. Um, they would say stuff like, oh, the blacks are, are a filthy and lazy and loathsome people. And they would talk about their ugly curly hair and their big noses. I mean, it was like reading Ku Klux Klan literature. Well, what happened? Oh, the other thing I forgot to tell you is that interracial marriage is a definite no-no. Uh, the black people are basically under a curse because of their inability to uh, fight valiantly in the pre-existence. Uh, in the 1970s, though, two things happened. One is the Mormon church started growing like crazy in Brazil. Now, I don't know if any of you have been down to Brazil, but it's a very multiracial society. And it's very hard to tell down there what, who's what. You know. And the Mormons used to teach that if you had even a single drop of black blood, you could not hold the priesthood. And basically, the Brazilian government told the Mormon church, if you don't get rid of this doctrine, we aren't going to let you in here. We aren't going to let you build a temple down here. Then the other thing that happened is, guess what? The IRS came along 
Everybody's favorite organization, right? And the IRS said, unless you change this doctrine, we're going to take away your tax-exempt status. Ooh, that hurts. You know, did the same thing to Bob Jones University, if you remember. So the Mormon church, guess what? See, this is how wonderful God is. He even obeys the Internal Revenue Service, right? So in 1978, the prophet at that time was Spencer W. Kimball. He was this little guy that looked like Yoda. And no, I'm not kidding. He actually, if you look at pictures of him, he looks like Yoda. He said he wasn't green, of course, but otherwise. And he got this revelation in 1978 that now blacks could hold the priesthood and that we're all one big, happy, interracial family now. So that's the story on the black people. So since that time, blacks can hold priesthood offices. They can go to the temple. They, I remember uh, there's a big article in the church news, which is, you know, obviously the official church newspaper of the Mormon church, when the first black couple got sealed in the temple, and they were standing there in their white suits, because see in the temple everybody wears white, and they were, you know, so happy that they were there. I mean, can you imagine being a black person and joining the Mormon church? I mean, that's like, you know, being a Jew and joining the Nazi party or being a black person and joining the Ku Klux Klan. But they do it. They have, and most of now the black people that are in the Mormon church either A, have never heard about this doctrine because now it's like, you know, 22 years old. And the Mormons are great at rewriting their history. In fact, let me tell you a little story about Mormon history. Brigham Young University has always had very strict dress codes. If you're a man... You can't have sideburns below here. You can't have a beard. and You can't have any more than the most minimal of mustaches. And of course, you have to have a nice, short, Mormon missionary type haircut. No hippies at BYU, let me tell you. Well, anyway, one of the Weisenheimer student leaders who happened to have a beard said, well, gee, there's a statue right in the courtyard of Brigham Young University of our founding president. And he had a beard. Now, what do you suppose the response of the Mormon church was to that? They chiseled off the beard, <laughs> off the statue. I, I kid you not. I kid you not. So as far as I know to this day, you still can't have a beard. In fact, I, I was telling some brother here last night, that, or wherever it was, maybe it was this morning, that... Um, that uh, I had to shave off my beard. I had a beard most of my adult life, and when I became an elders forum president, they told me, you've got to get rid of that beard because it's not godly. And I said, but Jesus had a beard. And, and, I, and I said, well, that was 2,000 years ago. And I said, yeah, but Brigham Young had a beard. And you should have seen Joseph, F wait, let me see, Joseph Fielding Smith's beard. He looked like one of the, those ZZ Top guys or whatever they are that had the real long beards. He says, well, we don't care what dead prophets did. Our living prophet doesn't have a beard, and so therefore you can't have a beard. So I shaved it off. And right after I got saved in 1984, my first act of rebellion, my first act of freedom in Jesus Christ was to grow this beard back, and I've had it ever since. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, dear. Let's see. All right. So moving along. The Mormon church has always been rather infamous for not liking to talk about its past very much. They very much believe in, that, in the principle that was stated in, 19, I don't know, how many of you read the book 1984? In there, it was the motto of the ministry of truth, that those who control the present control the past, and those who control the past control the future. And so... There's all these stories in the Mormon church, even among Mormons, about the church vault and how there's this vault, big walk-in, kind of like a small bank vault in the first presidency's office building where all these secret documents are that have God knows what, you know, stuff in them. And, and we don't know what any of this stuff is. But it's, it's really exciting stuff. And, and of course, Mormons are into genealogy. They're into, they love their history. They just don't like certain parts of it. <laughs> and so, in fact, many, most Mormons are encouraged to do their family history, to keep journals, you know, and, and all of that. There's nothing wrong with any of that in, in and of itself. So they're very much into that kind of thing. Because of that, they're into documents. Now, what happened in the 1980s, 
is there was this young fellow, Mark Hoffman, whose picture you see there. He was a returned Mormon missionary who was supposedly very good at finding documents, ancient documents. And he found several intriguing things and sold them for a lot of money. And then he found this letter that was called, the, the came to be known as the Salamander Letter. Because in this letter, he, it was supposedly written by either Joseph Smith or a close associate of Joseph Smith about how the angel Moroni was actually a salamander. And that the, 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 the angel, quote unquote, that had brought forth the Book of Mormon was a salamander. Now what's a salamander? I'm not talking about the lizard. The salamander is a fiery elemental being in the occult. Okay. So basically what this guy did, this Hoffman, is he went to the church leadership. He actually went to the prophet at this time, Spencer W. Kimball, and he said, I don't want the church to be damaged by this. I love the Mormon church, and this could really hurt Joseph Smith's reputation in the Book of Mormon, so I'd be willing to sell this document to you for like $300,000. You know, and they bought it. I'm not sure of that figure. Don't quote me on the figure, but it was a lot of money. It was at least a couple hundred grand. And a church has it. I mean, it makes more money than that every time, you know, it turns around. But anyhow, later on it was found out to be a forgery. Oops, there goes the prophet. I mean, you know, if he's a prophet, why couldn't he see this as a forgery? So this young man, he ended up getting into more and more financial trouble because he was selling documents that he himself had forged. And he was so good, the FBI couldn't even tell it was a forgery. That's how good this guy was. And he got in some financial trouble and he ended up putting pipe bombs in two people's, uh, one guy's office and one person's garage, blew up one of his business associates to kingdom come. They were full of nails. Nasty stuff. And then the other fellow, he put him in his driveway in a box and the fellow's poor wife went out, picked up the box, <laughs> blew her up. And over the course of a few weeks, and then, and then he in his own, I think he had a little VW, it blew up with him in it. Full of, and they assumed he was another person who was a victim of the bomb, but then the forensic people got in there and realized, he wasn't killed, by the way, Hoffman was not killed, he was just very badly injured, that this was it. That he was the bomber. And so he was put on trial, and it was a big scandal for the church. And basically, Hoffman plea bargained. And in exchange for you know, pleading down the crime, because he murdered two people, basically in cold blood. And the Mormon church was terrified that it would have to get on the witness stand, that its leaders, Kimball and Hinckley and some of the other high-level leaders, would actually have to get on the witness stand. Because this made them look really bad. Because here they're supposed to be prophets, seers, and revelators, and yet they were taken by this, you know, 25, 30-year-old kid, you know. So... He, he got basically a smaller sentence than a typical guy that knocks over a gas station in downtown Salt Lake. So that's, that's what's happened. Now, in recent years, something has happened. Uh, since the presidency of the prophethood of David O. McKay, who reigned from the 1950s to the early 60s, he was a salesman. That's how he made his millions. And he started getting the idea that the Mormon church should present itself door-to-door -door just like you sell vacuum cleaners or encyclopedias. And they had a great sales pitch going. And the church started really growing in the 1960s. And it started mushrooming. I mean, there was like 4 million Mormons by the early 19, by I think 19, early 1970s. By, by the time I was in the church, it was up to 8 million. And it was growing and growing and growing and getting richer and richer and richer. And by the time I left the church, the church was crowding 10 million people. And uh, it today is one of the wealthiest, most powerful churches in the world. The reason for this astonishing growth, other than the fact that they, they use these sales type techniques, I think is partly because, especially in the last 20 years, the, the Mormon church has gone to a lot of advertising. I'm sure many of you have seen the TV commercials. Uh, they have tons of money to spend. This, this church is wealthy beyond anybody's wildest dreams. And, and in all their advertising and in everything they've been doing in the last 15, 20 years, they've been de-emphasizing the things that make them unique. And they've been trying to appear to be just another Protestant church. So, for example, if you were to go in the visitor's center at Salt Lake Temple Square, 
you would find a lot of the things that I saw when I was a Mormon aren't there anymore. Things about the vision that Joseph had in the sacred grove, things about the priesthood and all of this stuff, it's all gone now. Everything's now about Jesus. And they keep talking about how the Book of Mormon is just another testament of Jesus Christ. So because they've managed to kind of, if you will, lie by omission, and on the other hand, throw millions and millions of dollars of advertising money at this, they have really been able to grow very well uh, to the point that they are one of the fastest growing churches really in the world today. Now, what do these people believe? What makes them so far off course? Well, basically, first of all, the, one of the fundamental concepts underneath Mormonism is the idea of what they call the great apostasy. This is the idea that at some point back in time, uh, probably around the time of Constantine, the true church of Jesus Christ fell from grace. It, it basically went belly up. It became co-opted by Constantine, who was, of course, the Roman emperor that supposedly became Christian. And since that time, the, the church has been in darkness. There's been no true gospel, no true prophets, etc., etc. So that was the first problem. Then, so we got over a thousand years of spiritual darkness. Now, of course, this is interesting because Jesus said that, you know, he would build his church upon the rock and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And he also said at the end of Matthew 28 that he would be with us always even unto the end of the age. So something's amiss here. But anyway, they believe that then during the Protestant Reformation with Luther and Calvin and Knox and some of the others, that the light began to redawn. But that was just a preparation. Okay? The real light dawned when Joseph Smith, Jr. in 1830 restored the fullness of the everlasting gospel, as they call it. So that is one fundamental belief, and that was reflected in the scripture I read you from their work out of the, um, the Joseph Smith history and the Pearl of Great Price, that all churches today are basically apostate. You know, whether Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal, doesn't matter. All churches today are, are essentially apostate. So that's their one concept that's very central. Therefore, we have a need for living prophets today. They will tell you, for example, that um, the Bible, for example, the, the eighth article of faith of the Mormon church says, we believe the Bible to be the word of God insofar as it's translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Now, look at that. There's no caveat with the Book of Mormon. They believe the Book of Mormon is absolutely pristine, perfect, and true because it was buried in a mountain for basically six, no, 2,000, 1,100, 1,200 years. Okay? So it's pure. The Bible, Joseph Smith has told us, has been tampered with by corrupt priests and monks over the centuries. And so therefore, it cannot be trusted. And we need a living prophet to help us know how to interpret the scriptures. So, you know, that's why we need a living prophet. Another concept within the Mormon church, and this sounds kind of funny, but a living prophet is better than a dead prophet. Now, in a way that sounds sensible. I mean, obviously, if you're alive, it's better than if you're dead. But on the other hand, what that means is is that if Isaiah says something and the living prophet today, Gordon B. Hinckley, says something else, what Isaiah said doesn't matter because Gordon Hinckley is our living prophet right now. And what he says is what counts. Okay. Now, in the Book of Mormon, basically they have what are called four standard works. And these are all canonical books for the Mormons, okay? First of all, there's the Bible, of course. But then there's this triple combination I mentioned earlier, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. So these three books are also part of sacred scripture according to Mormon doctrine. Now, another key belief that in the Mormon church that separates Mormons from other, other churches is their belief that families are forever. In fact, I had a Mormon friend when I was a Mormon tell me that he says, if you don't really believe families are forever, you try going on a trip in a car to Disney World with eight children. And if families aren't forever, they sure seem like they're forever by the time you get to Orlando. 
So anyway, um, they believe the family unit continues after death if and only if you are a temple Mormon who is true and faithful to all your covenants. Now see, they believe they can go to the temple, and we're going to talk more about this in a few minutes, but they can go to the temple and be sealed for time and all eternity and carry on their marriage into heaven and beyond. And my wife and I did that. Um, and what this means is they can have internal increase of their seed. And we'll talk more about that later. Another distinctive belief of Mormonism is they say that there's three duties of the church to preach the gospel, to perfect the saints, and to redeem the dead. Now, I don't have any problem with the first two, but the third one is a little bit odd. They believe they have to redeem the dead. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that they, the, see, they look at, there's those two passages in Peter where he talks about Jesus going and preaching to the spirits in prison. And, you know, for this cause is the gospel preached to them that are dead. You know, they claim that what happens is, is that if you died like before the time of Jesus, or if you died even, say, right now, but you were some kind of aborigine or person who lived out in the middle of, like, Africa somewhere, and you never heard about Jesus, you never heard about Joseph Smith. You know, because you've got to know about both of them to really be saved. You understand that. So therefore, what do you do? You, go to, you die, you're going to go to hell. Well, first of all, Mormons don't exactly believe in hell, but we'll discuss that in a bit later. But the, the idea behind what they do is they believe it is their mandate to go and do genealogy for everyone who's ever lived. They believe that they, they and right now they have millions of names in their genealogical database. They spend untold amounts of money going all over the world and this is the church itself, looking in church records in Europe, checking cemeteries, checking courthouse records all over the, the world, literally, trying to find the names of as many dead people as possible. And plus, each individual Mormon, part of your duty, one of your commandments as a Mormon, is you have to do your own personal family genealogy back at least four generations or more. So you have to figure out who your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents were and get the days of their birth, the days of their death, and the days of their marriage if they married. When you get that information, that is sent in to the genealogical library in Salt Lake City where it's processed. And if it's found to be acceptable, then you go and you do proxy work. It's called work temple proxy, proxy temple work for the dead. And what this means is is that you go to the temple, and if it's a relative of yours, that's one thing, or it could be if you don't have anybody that you've done recently, they'll just give you a name at random, like, you know, Lars Storstrand or something from Norway who died back in 1870, and you go through the temple for him. And you get baptized for him, you receive the priesthood for him in proxy, you go through your endowments, and if he was married, you get married to his wife by proxy, if that information is available, and what they believe happens then is that up in spirit prison, Mormon missionary angels come and knock at your door of Lars, whatever his name is, and Mrs. Lars, and says, okay, you've just gone through all your, all your um, ordinances down on earth. Do you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and Joseph Smith? And if they say yes, then poof, they instantly go to the celestial kingdom. If they say no, they go down. So that's how it works. And that's why Mormons are so into genealogy. Uh, and that's why if you, I mean, I'll tell you, if any of you are doing that as a hobby, and I don't believe there's anything wrong with genealogy, uh, the best place to go to get records is the Mormons now have a website where you can go and you can look up your family line and everything. They're very good at it. You know, they've spent, they've spent a king's ransom over the years. But here's the funny thing about this, is if you look at it, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to do somebody in the, de in the temple for the dead. Because that's how long, that's flat out as short a time as you can do the ritual. And you can only do it one at a time. And I can remember when I would go to the Washington Temple in D.C., because that was our temple, uh, they'd have a computer readout. They'd actually show you, okay, tick, 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 you know, because there might be 150 or 200 people in that temple at the same time all doing rituals for the dead. And they keep track of it. But they, the Mormons can't even keep up with the death rate. 
Right now, people are dying faster than the Mormons can do them. To say nothing of the fact that there's supposedly, someone figured out, Lord knows how, that there's over 13 billion people who have lived on the earth since the dawn of creation. And the Mormons got to do all of them. So far, they've done several million. But that's a long way from 13 billion. So anyhow, it's kind of... Of course, they believe they'll have the millennium to do it, and that's what they think they're going to spend a lot of their time in the millennium is, is doing work for the dead because when they're in the millennium, they won't have to work for a living. So anyway, who knows? This is, I don't know how well you can see the picture, but this is where I was baptized for the dead 42 times in one day. That is the baptismal font for the dead. And if you'll notice, it looks just like the brazen sea that's mentioned in the Bible. It's supported by 12 brazen oxen. And the thing on top there that looks like a cereal bowl, that's the font. And um, by the time, this is an older picture by the time I was in there, they actually have a computer monitor there. And it was a huge, large monitor and it would bring up the name. And I would walk into the font and they'd say, um, you know, Brother Sneblin, having authority in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize you for and on behalf of Clement Sneblin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Poosh! And then the next name would come up, Brother Snevelin, having authority, blah, 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 and then, poosh. So I got baptized 42 times in one day because some lady in the ward, because you see, only men can do men, and only women can do women. So like I had to ask my wife to go through for my departed mother. So that is the baptismal font in the, in the temple in Salt Lake. It's the nicest one, and it, it is something to see. It's quite awesome. Okay, I guess we talked about this. Okay, now here's the other thing. The other neat, not neat concept, but key concept in the LDS church is the need for the priesthood. They believe that without the priesthood, you can't do anything. There is no authority without the priesthood. You can't be baptized. You can't be sealed. You can't be married. Uh, you can't have your sins forgiven. Nothing. All of the power is contained in the priesthood. It's not quite like what you're thinking of, say, in the Catholic church. Because in the Mormon church, everybody over the age of 14, it's a man, has the priesthood. It's a male. Uh, unless you're some real lowlife or something. I mean, if you're some you know, evil person that smokes or drinks coffee or is out there you know, smoking or chewing or go with, going with girls that do or whatever, you know, then you won't get the priesthood. But normally you get the priesthood if you're, if you're 14 years old. And anybody at the age of 14 can do the sacrament which means their Lord's Supper. Uh, you can baptize at the age of, I think it's 14 or, yeah, 14 years old. You can baptize people. So all of this is within. And you see, there can be no prophecy. There can be no authority without the priesthood. And I already talked about how shaky the foundation of their priesthood is, about the, the baptismal charade in the Susquehanna River. So, But this is a key idea of theirs. They don't believe exactly like Christians do, that there's a priesthood of all believers, that if you're, if you're born again, as Peter said, you're part of a royal nation, uh, a holy people, wait, no, a peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. That isn't what the Mormons believe. So they believe that only men hold the priesthood. Although women have this cute little thing they say in the church. They say, people say that, that women in our church don't hold the priesthood, but every night when I go to bed, I hold the priesthood. Meaning she hugs her wife, her husband, you know. Isn't that cute? Doesn't it just make you want to go, ooh? Anyway, high level of triacle in the Mormon church, let me warn you. Okay, what about the sacrament? Well, when the Mormons say the sacrament, it, it is a thing they do once a week, and it's kind of like a Protestant communion service. They have two elders or occasionally priests up there in front, and they have the table with the little cuppy things, just like you probably do in your churches, except they use wonder bread and water. That's what their sacrament is. They might occasionally, if someone gets real ambitious, one of the Relief Society sisters, and I should tell you, the Relief Society is the woman's auxiliary of the Mormon church. Their motto is, charity never faileth. And it's the Relief Society that is responsible for doing all of the charitable work in the church. They are famous for being able to produce a casserole on demand. 
virtually instantly. They can have a casserole. If, if someone is sick or if some sisters come home from the hospital just having a baby, bam, there's 20 casseroles at the door within five minutes. I mean, it's phenomenal. But anyway, so every now and then a Relief Society sister will make some homemade bread. But they just use regular old bread, and they just, I can remember many times standing in the back of the, of, the of, the, uh, of the meeting hall, breaking up loaves of Wonder Bread into little chunks and having it sit on this little gold platter, you know. And then they go out there and they, they pray over it, and, they, and it's not, you know, it's, it's pretty much like the Protestant idea of communion. But, you know, the question is asked, why water? I mean, does water look like blood or water? I mean, at least grape juice. Well, the story is that one time, and this is, this is one of those Mormon stories, you get lots of what they call faith-promoting stories in the Mormon church. The story is that one day Joseph Smith had sent somebody out to get a keg of wine to use for sacrament meeting. And they were coming back with this keg of wine on their back, and this was in the middle of some controversies about the church, and um, an angel stopped him. And he said, why are you stopping me? And he says, because someone has put poison in that cask of wine. And so they dumped it out and they used water. And so Joseph Smith decreed at that point that we should always just use water because it's very hard to poison water and it's so easy to, to come by and everything. Well, I believe there's a reason for this. And that is, it's a very good way of keeping people from thinking about the blood of Jesus. Because if you're meditating on this hunk of wonder bread and this little cup of water, where's the blood? It's a bloodless thing. And that's because Mormons don't believe they're saved by the blood of Jesus. In fact, an early Mormon apostle, Orson Pratt, now hold on to your seats, folks. He said that the blood of Jesus has no more power than the blood of a dead dog. You know, can you imagine where he is now? Anyway, that's the sacrament, and they do that once a week. Now there's bearing your testimony. This is another important thing. Now, when Christians think of testimony... They think of, you know, okay, this is how I got saved. That's like I gave you my testimony an hour ago or so. Well, that's not what Mormons think. Mormons believe a testimony is when you get up there and you say something to this effect. I bear you my testimony that God lives, that the Mormon church is true, that Jesus is the Christ, that the Book of Mormon is true. By the way, I really love my wife, and I, I really love my kids, and I, I, I love my, oh, I love my bishop. You know, and they, they literally, grown men break down and cry. It's, it's kind of sweet in a way, and, and it's genuine. I don't doubt for a minute that it's genuine because I did it. You know, they, they're up there in front of a 200-person ward weeping about how much they love their wives, or, or they'll have little kids. You know, a five-year-old kid gets to think, I really need it. That Joseph Smith is a prophet, and, and, I, and I believe in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> they get him started real early, almost when you're knee-high to a seagull. You're up there giving your testimony. And notice how Jesus is hardly mentioned, okay? Now, on fast and testimony meeting, this is when they train people. Because once a month, and I don't think this is a bad idea. What the Mormon church requires its people to do is on one Sunday a month, they fast. And they take all the money that they would have spent on food for that day and give it to the church welfare fund. And then that's distributed to the poor of the war. And, and then, and the fasting is, that, like, like Christians believe, it's supposed to help them be more spiritually attuned or whatever. And then it's the one week of the month where nothing is scripted. Because usually everything in a Mormon church service is scripted. And I've got to tell you one thing about the church. If you ever go to a Mormon church... Prepare for some world-class boredom. There are no trained speakers or preachers in the Mormon church because there's no professional clergy. Usually it's, it's teenagers getting up and reading some article out of the Ensign magazine or it's some insurance salesman, I'm not against insurance salesmen, they're not great preachers usually, getting up and, and mumbling their way through some article they tried to write or some woman getting up and talking about, you know, how, you know, baking bread relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ and how great it is to have home food storage. That's a Mormon meeting, usually. And every word has to be approved by the bishop. You have to present your talk in advance to the bishop to be sure it's doctrinally correct. And mind you, understand, the bishop 
like a pastor. I mean, when we think of bishop, we think of some guy who's high up there somewhere. But in the Mormon church, a bishop is just the head of a local congregation. So anyhow, this is this fast meeting, testimony meeting, is the one weekend of the month where you can get up there and say anything you want. And you've got to understand something. In Mormon circles, it's very bad etiquette to interrupt someone when they're bearing their testimony. So some people might get up there and start out fine and say, I want to bury my testimony that Jesus is the Christ and Joseph Smith is true and blah, blah, blah. And then he starts saying, oh, and, and by the way, I, I believe that Jesus is coming back in a UFO and that there are ancient American airfields down in, down in Peru and that flying saucers landed down there. And, and by the way, I love my wife. And, I mean, it could go on for hours, literally. And we had some sacrament meetings that were fast meetings that ran like a half hour to 45 minutes overtime because there's no way to stop them. Until they say, in Jesus' name, amen, that's it. You've got to sit there and listen, no matter what bilge they might be spouting. And, and so it's, it, I used to kind of look forward to it, you know, because you never knew what was going to happen. Otherwise, everything was so drollingly monotonous and boring. I mean, you know, it was more interesting to watch ice melt than it was to go to a Mormon church service. <laughs> but I did it, I did it out of a sense of duty, because I really love the church. And I figure, well, somehow or other, I'm getting brownie points for this up in heaven. It's another brick in my celestial mansion. Yes! You know, well, here's the thing. In fact, i got to tell you, there's a cartoon. And one thing I will give the Mormons, they do laugh at themselves. There was a cartoon in a Mormon magazine where it showed these two guys coming up to heaven, and there's this one guy who's like this, this haggard-looking prophet, you know, and he's in chains, and you, you kind of think of a Dimitri Dudeman-type person who's been horribly beaten for the gospel and tortured and, you know, and all of this, and, and he's up there, and, and the angel says, well, you know, why should I let you into heaven? And he goes through this whole thing about how he was tortured and tormented horribly and this and that. And they, okay, you can go in. And then the next guy comes up, and he's this sort of nice, normal-looking guy in a suit and tie, and he says, how about you? He says, well, I was a faithful Mormon. I sat through sacrament meetings my whole life. Oh, well, you get a higher place in heaven, you know, because it was more torture to do that than it was to be beaten with an inch of your life. The Mormons know it's boring. They just sort of put up with it. But the thing about these testimony meetings is it's a kind of mind control because Mormons are, are trained like this from birth. And you, if you watch a Mormon... And they start doing this to you, because invariably they will. If you start really witnessing to them and, and really kind of pressing them a little bit, of course you want to do it in love, but all of a sudden watch their eyes when they start doing this. Well, what you say might be so, but I bear you my testimony that, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and that Jesus Christ lives and that the Mormon church is... Watch their eyes. Their eyes are like going... You know, like, you know, they're, they're, like they're hypnotized. And the weirdest thing you can do to them at this point, I'll give you a little secret, this is like spiritual warfare training, okay, is if they start doing this to you, you say, wait a minute. And they'll go, I mean, it's, it's like you, 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 you knock them out of their trance. And you say, why do you believe Joseph Smith is true, or a true prophet, or whatever? Why do you believe the church is true? What rational reason do you have? And you know what they'll tell you? Well, I have a burning in my bosom. No, that's what they will say. They will literally say that. My heart felt strangely warmed when I read the Book of Mormon. Yeah, what did you have for dinner that night? Anyway, so that's the sacrament meeting, and, or the, the fast and testimony meeting, and it's a very important part of the Mormon thing. Now, they, they also believe in temples and restored worship. They believe that their temples are virtually identical to the temple that Solomon built. And it's the holiest thing they can do is to go and partake of their own endowment. Now, what's an endowment? Well, it means literally a gift. And they believe the endowment is the most important gift they can receive. And that's the ability to marry for time and all eternity and to receive the tokens of the priesthood, the sacred, secret tokens of the priesthood. Now, eternal marriages and work for the dead also can only be done in temples. Then there's the word of wisdom. This is the LDS health code that's found in section 89 of Doctrine and Covenants. Basically, it's this. No alcohol, no tobacco, no caffeine. Uh, they didn't use that word, of course, in the original revelation because nobody knew what caffeine was. They basically said to stay away from hot drinks. And the church over the years has interpreted that to mean coffee, tea, or any caffeinated beverages, whether they're hot or cold. 
And then it says, and most Mormons ignore this last thing, it says meat only sparingly or in winter. Then I have the food storage in the bishop's warehouses. It's true, Mormons do take care of their own, but only their own. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, they have a, an astonishing church welfare system that a lot, of, a lot of churches could learn from. They have their own industries. They have woolen mills. They have canneries. They have farms. They have ranches. And what happens is, if, let's say you lose your job, which is happening a lot nowadays. Well, you go to your bishop, and you say, Bishop, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't support my family right now. And they don't encourage people to go on welfare at all. In fact, they're very proud of the fact that very few Mormons are on welfare. So what they'll do is they'll give you free food every week for as long as you need. If necessary, they'll pay your electric bill. That's what this fast and testimony money is for. But additionally, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You have to go and work um, in the local cannery, the local woolen mill, the local farm, whatever, you know, and work the amount of money to pay that back because they believe that idleness is a sin. And that, you know, none of this is really wrong. I think it's kind of a neat thing that they're doing. Uh, but they will never take care of someone that's not a Mormon. And this has kind of freaked out a few people. And so sometimes people don't donate food, and it's taken to what is called, euphemistically, the bishop's warehouse, which is really not the bishop's warehouse, but it's, it's somewhere in a community. And they have, I mean, it's like going into a supermarket. You can actually go and shop there. In a, in, a, in a city where there's lots of Mormons, I mean, that may not be true around here, but if you were to go out to like Idaho or Utah, you would find Mormon supermarkets that are called Bishop's Warehouse. And if you present a note from your bishop saying that you can go there, you can go and shop, and it's all free. It doesn't cost a thing. Okay, in fact, when I, I ran into some hard times, and for a while the Mormon church provided us food, it provided us with, um, with insurance money every month to pay our medical insurance. It was a good deal. Of course, you have to be faithful. If you're not a good Mormon, they won't do that. If you haven't been paying your... And you, oh, we've got to talk about tithing for a minute. Because Mormons... Now get this. A typical faithful Mormon tithes at the rate of 25%. Now think of that. Because they're required to give 10% of gross... Whatever their gross income is, you've got to give that. Right off the top, God gets that. And I think that's fine. But now in addition to that, they have their church welfare offering. They have their uh, church building fund offering. And they also might give money to, like, say, help build a temple in the, in the region or something like that. And so a lot of Mormons end up giving about 25% of their gross income to the Mormon church. And if you don't do that, A, you don't qualify for church welfare, B, you don't, um, you don't get into the temple. You cannot ever go to the temple unless you're a faithful tithe payer. And you see, the bishop, if you go to the bishop and ask to have a temple recommend, which is the little card you get so you can go to the temple, they have the keys of discernment. <laughs> you know, And they can tell if you're not a full tithe payer. And they can tell if you're cheating on your wife. Or they can tell if you're not paying all your income tax. So... That's another whole thing. But that's why the church is so wealthy. You know, it's because partly, because first of all, it, it invests things very well. It's got, it has some of the great captains of industry are the heads of the Mormon church from any given generation. Uh, most of the people that run the Mormon church are self-made millionaires. You know, and they know how to use their money. They know how to invest it wisely. And also because people tithe so generously. Because if they, they think if they don't, they're damned. See, because we have the age of grace, amen, you know, we believe, oh, we can give whatever we want, you know, la-di-da, you know, here's a quarter for you, pastor, you know, well, you know, <laughs> and what are you going to do? There are good things and bad things about grace, but I believe in, the, in grace, believe me, I'm not knocking it. Now, here's what's wrong with the Mormon church, and I believe there's certain things that we can agree to disagree about, you know, like... Do you have wine or grape juice in communion? Do you baptize by sprinkling or dunking? Do you sing the old standard hymns or do you do worship choruses? You know, that kind of stuff. All of that's not important, really, in the vast scheme of things. But there are certain non-negotiable things that make you a Christian. The nature of God, what do you believe about that? Who is Jesus? What must I do to be saved? And the Bible and the nature of Revelation. So we're going to look at these things this 
through this, we're going to use this grid, so to speak, and examine what Mormons believe about these things. Well, first of all, the Mormons deny the Trinity. They believe that the Trinity is a pagan concept. Instead, they believe in a polytheistic universe. Now, that's a big word, but it means essentially that there's many gods. Early Mormon prophets taught that there are more gods out there in the universe than there are uh, sands on the seashore. They believe that our God, who rules over our solar system, his name is Elohim, and his son is Jehovah. Now, Jehovah is the pre-existent name of Jesus. So, you know, already we're a little weird here, but anyhow, they believe that our God is under other gods, and that there's a committee of gods above him that if he does something wrong, they can fire him and replace him with a different god. Okay? So obviously, this is not the supreme being of the universe. This is just some local tin pot deity. Okay? Uh, now also, God the Father is not a spirit but he is a man of body, parts, and passions, with everything that means. In other words, basically, if you'd want to imagine the Mormon God, think of him as kind of like Superman without the blue underwear. That's what you know, God is. He's, he's an extraordinarily wise, extraordinarily powerful being, but he's not all-powerful, he's not all-present, he's not all-knowing. Okay? He might be in one corner of the universe and he'd have to send an angel to fly off to a different part of the universe and tell him what's going on over here in Promixa Centauri or something. So he is not omniscient. Now, additionally, they have a, I think it was Lorenzo Snow, who was one of the early Mormon prophets, he said this, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. In other words, you can become a god. If you're a worthy Mormon man, you can become a god. And if you're a worthy Mormon woman, you can become a domestic goddess. You ever wonder where Roseanne got that expression, domestic goddess? That's because she was raised as a Jew in Utah. Did you know that? And believe it, you know how her, this is totally irrelevant, her father made his living selling crucifixes door to door in Utah. And he was Jewish. <laughs> no wonder she's a little screwed up anyway. <laughs> So that's literally what women believe. They believe that they will be goddesses someday, and the men believe they will become gods. And um, that is one of the cardinal Mormon doctrines. It's called the law of eternal progression. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, says this. God is not a man that he should lie, not of the son of man that he should repent. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but in verse 8 there it says, God is speaking, he says, "'You are my witnesses.'" Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God I know not any. So if God doesn't know about any other gods, how come there are all these gods out there? Is he ignorant or what? Okay. And of course the Bible also says, I am the Lord, I change not. So this idea that God can evolve, that he can be a man and then evolve into godhood is not true. And of course Jesus himself said that God is a spirit. So, then we have Jesus. That's the famous statue of Jesus that is in the... It's an awesome statue. It's about 20 feet high in the uh, Mormon Visitor Center in Salt Lake. And uh, basically, Jesus is just the Son of God, but he is not Almighty God. He is our elder brother. His younger brother is, is Lucifer. And then we're behind somewhere. We're all Jesus' little brothers and sisters. So we're all qualitatively the same. There's no difference between me and Jesus, except Jesus is older and wiser and smarter. Jesus is also begotten by God the Father having sex with Mary. Now, most Mormons, they don't even know about that doctrine. But it was taught to me in a meeting by a general authority as recently as 1984. So that isn't some ancient arcane doctrine they no longer believe in. So basically, think about it. Mary is one of God's daughters, according to Mormon theology, and he came down and had sex with her to produce Jesus. So Jesus is a child of celestial incest. The atonement had nothing to do with the cross. We already, in fact, they believe that the atonement took place in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus suffered there and sweat great drops of blood. So notice how all these different groups always tippy-toe around Calvary. They don't want to talk about Calvary. The J-dubs don't, the Mormons don't. The devil doesn't like that cross. But the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus, folks. That's Jesus. And, of course, this talks about how it says that the, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost, Matthew 1.20. I'm running out of time here. So, again, this is the same thing. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. That's what it teaches. Now, what about salvation? Well, in, there's three degrees of salvation in the Mormon church. Three degrees of heaven. If you're this kind of couch potato bozo, who maybe you go to church on Christmas and Easter, or maybe you're even some lowlife like a pimp or a prostitute or a drug dealer, you know, whatever, you're going to go to the celestial kingdom. And that is basically a place that's just like this. It's got storms, it's got disease, it's got pain, it's got injury, it's got mosquitoes and gnats, and that's where you're going to be for all eternity. Now, if you're a worthy, hard-working member of any religion, Buddhist, Lutheran, Catholic, or whatever, and you're living up to all the light you have, you'll go to the terrestrial kingdom, as will most Mormons. This is a place that's like the Garden of Eden, where you'll live on earth for all eternity in paradisical glory. And, and you'll get to see Jesus because Jesus will reign over this kingdom. But you will never see Heavenly Father. The celestial kingdom, this is for the elite few Mormons who have been to the temple and kept all of their covenants therein. And there they will see Heavenly Father. And now, you've got to keep at least 600 commandments and also the word of wisdom. Temple covenants are needed to be obeyed at all times, being true and faithful to those covenants. There's four laws that you're introduced to in the temple. The law of obedience. Basically, the husband swears, he puts his arm to the square, and he swears that he will obey God and all church leaders as if they were God. The wife swears that she will obey her husband as he obeys the Lord, as if he were God. The law of sacrifice is that you basically are willing to offer everything that you possess, everything that you have, to the furtherance of the kingdom of God here on earth. In other words, the Mormon church. The law of the gospel is basically the idea that you have to be a member of the church in order to be saved. The law of chastity is that you, are, you, you keep yourself pure. Basically, it's what the church, any Christian would believe. that You keep yourself pure until marriage, and after marriage, you're faithful to your wife. Who is really damned? Well, Bruce R. McConkie says that anybody in the Mormon church that does not make it to the celestial kingdom is eternally damned. Now, only one in ten Mormons goes to the temple. And of them, only about half of them ever return. And of them, only about half have their temple recommend and are considered worthy. So that means the Mormon church has somewhere around a 95 to 97 percent failure rate. Most of those people are damned. Wouldn't that be a great church? Join our church and you've got a 1 in 10 chance of making it. Isn't it wonderful to be you know, part of the true church of Jesus Christ where you're saved by simple faith and grace? You know, Hallelujah. Blood atonement. Why are there firing squads in Utah? This doctrine is not well talked about anymore. Mormons are very embarrassed by it, but it's in the books. There are Five things for which the blood of Jesus will never atone. Murder, adultery, homosexuality, apostasy from the true church, and marrying a black person. Those are the five unpardonable sins. And if, you're one of, if you commit one of those five sins, the only way you will ever get into any of the kingdoms, any of the kingdoms, is to have your blood spilled out upon the earth so that the smoke of its incense might ascend to heaven. Think about that. That's why I and Ed Decker and many others who have left the church have had death threats against us. But like I tell people, my dad can beat up their dad. Amen? Hallelujah. But they believe the only way to save us is to kill us. Think about that. That's why, if you ever any of you heard of Gary Gilmore? He was a guy in Utah who was a gas station. He, I mean, I'm sorry, he was a crook who robbed a gas station, shot the guy and murdered him. And he was not a very good Mormon, but he was a Mormon, and he begged to have a firing squad, and they did. They shot him because he knew that was the only way he was going to get 
to heaven. But the Bible, as we know, says we are saved by grace through faith without works. Now what about Revelation? Well, Mormons believe the Bible is flawed and insufficient. It needs to be corrected by a living prophet. We've already kind of talked about that. Now here's the funny thing. We've mentioned before what's in this triple combination. Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. But there's problems with these things. For one thing, they contradict one another. The Book of Mormon, for example, contradicts many LDS doctrines. Now, let me explain what we mean by that. Just as an example, I've mentioned already Mormons deny the Trinity. Let me read to you. This is right out of Mormon scripture. Let's see. We're going to go to 2 Nephi 11.7. That's one of the books in the Book of Mormon. 2 Nephi 11.7. Not to be confused with Great Nehi. Any of you watch MASH in the old days? Okay. Um, it says that there is a God and he is Christ and he cometh in the fullness of his own time. That sounds like pretty good preaching, doesn't it? That Jesus is God. And then we go to 26, 12 of the same thing. Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. Pretty good. Now, all of this is contrary to Mormon theology. 31, chapter 31. This is, listen to this. This is right out of the Book of Mormon. And this is the doctrine of Christ, and on the only and true doctrine of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. Now, that's clearer than the Bible. I mean... There's only one verse in the whole Bible, which is 1 John 5, 7, which, of course, all the apostate Bibles remove, that teaches that. You know, and there's about three or four other places where the Book of Mormon clearly teaches the Trinity, and yet the Trinity is a false doctrine. I can do that same thing with about five other major Mormon doctrines. Why is that? Well, it's because the Mormon church is a, qu is a crazy quilt religion that was put together, patchworked over time, and Joseph Smith's teachings, beliefs, changed from the 1830s to the 1840s. But he was stuck with this book. He couldn't change it once he published it, you know. So their, their only answer to that is that a living prophet is better than a dead prophet. And so therefore a dead prophet has the right to contradict, uh, pardon me, a living prophet has the right to contradict a dead prophet. Here's some examples. Brigham Young said that no black person would hold the priesthood until every white man ever who lived on the earth, living or dead, had received the priesthood. Prophet Kimball contradicted this in 1978. Joseph Smith said that no one could attain the highest degree of glory without plural marriage. President Woodruff made it an uh, excommunicable offense to marry more than one wife. So, you know, I tell people the Mormon God changes his mind more often than his underwear. Then there's the temple. Uh, I wish I had time. If you want to know more about the temple, you really got to buy that book that Stan showed you, Mormonism's Temple of Doom. But basically, there's three parts to the temple endowment ceremony. First of all, there's washings and anointings. This is where you go through and you're virtually nude. You just have this little, like, serape thing over you. And your, your <clears throat> private parts, etc., are washed and anointed by other members of your own sex. And then you're given this, this magical underwear, this temple garment that's supposed to protect you from danger... As, from the power of the destroyer as long as you're here on your mission here on earth. That's done first. Then you're given your little package of sacred temple robes and sent upstairs. Then you go through the creation room, the garden room, the celestial room, and finally the veil in the celestial room. This is, I don't know how well you can see it, but I was in this room. That is the celestial room of the Salt Lake Temple. You see that little staircase there? That's where um, God, pardon me, where Adam and Michael, pardon me, Adam and Jehovah come down the stairs to create the world. And that little altar there, you see that little white cube in the center? That's where a, a person who represents everybody kneels at that altar and swears oaths and covenants to keep the laws of that particular room, of that particular world. Um, this is the celestial room. And what you do is you go through and you learn these secret handshakes and these secret words, and finally you're ready to go up to the veil. There's this veil that separates the rest of the temple from the celestial room. And this veil has a square and compass in it. 
And the way it works is you come up, and you've been somewhat prompted on this. You come up, you put your foot to the person on the other side of the veil's foot. Knee to knee, hand to back, breast to breast, mouth to ear, and you embrace through the veil. And the guy on the other side, you got your hand in this, this handshake thing, and the guy on the other side is representing Heavenly Father. And you whisper the secret and effable name of the second token of the Melchizedek priesthood into his ear. And if you know it, he will usher you into the celestial kingdom. I bet you're all just dying to know what that secret and effable name is. Well, you ready? Health in the navel, marrow in the bones, strength in the loins and in the sinews, power in the priesthood be upon me and upon my posterity throughout all generations of time and all eternity. One heck of a name, isn't it? Now, it doesn't even mention Jesus. I mean, that's actually an occult incantation. It really is. I document that in my book. But anyhow, you're ushered into this room, and it's important that you understand that they believe that God the Father literally is in this room. He's walking around in there. It is like the holy place. Now, you see that little room in the, in the center where the dark door is? That's the holy of holies. No one is allowed in that room except the 12 apostles and the prophet. No one ever goes into that room. But you can, if you've gone through the temple, you can sit there a while and you can feel the presence of God in that room. I didn't feel anything, but, you know, who knows. Anyway, and then there's the marriage room. That's it. That's the ceiling room. And this is where you get your eternal increase. If you can imagine... The man, the groom, kneels on one side of that altar. The bride kneels on the other side. It's beautiful marble with upholstered kneelers. You take each other's hands in the patriarchal grip across that altar. And there's a, you see that kind of throne-like chair behind? The sealer guy, who is, he's a high priest who has direct keys authority from the prophet. There's only you know, probably a hundred of these men in the world that have this authority to do this. And he will stand there and he will seal you for time and all eternity. And that means you will go on into the eternities. You will have, um, whoops, wrong way. You will have eternal increase. That means you'll have babies all through the eternities. And, uh, you know, you will have thousands and thousands of spirit children. If you're a Mormon wife, you're going to be eternally pregnant. You're going to be always pregnant. Isn't that special? Anyway, the temple ritual was so similar to Masonic ritual that for a century the Grand Lodge of Utah declared that the LDS church was a clandestine lodge. In other words, a fake Masonic lodge operating without warrant. There are heavy influences of both witchcraft, occultism, and Freemasonry in the temple rites. Witches also believe you can be married for time and all eternity. Did you know that? Exact same idea, except... They, oh, oh, did you don't, by the way, that Mormons believe in Heavenly Mother? There's actually a Mormon hymn about Heavenly Mother and that God and Heavenly Mother are up there. One guy actually figured it out. Just to keep going with the United States, God has to have sex every seven seconds to keep up with the birth rate in the United States. And the fellow said it's a wonder he has time to run the universe. You know, he's having sex every seven seconds. And, of course, that's why he needs many wives. Because obviously a woman can only have one or maybe two or maybe three babies at a time, you know, under normal conditions. So he's got a harem up there of hundreds of wives because he's got to keep the whole earth populated. This exaltation process, which is what they call becoming a god, they call it your exaltation. It could take millions of years. Now, this is what, this is what you get if you make it through all this. If you keep all your covenants, you'll eventually get your own solar system all yours, you know, kind of like those Sim City games, you know, on the computers. You populate it with your very own spirit children, millions of them, millions upon millions of these spirit children. Families are really forever. Hallelujah. Uh, but what happens to your firstborn son? See, you're going to have to have your own Jesus. Your firstborn son is going to have to go down there, incarnate, and die on the cross for that particular planetary system. And then they'll all be saved, you know. 
And of course, I already mentioned the idea of a spiritual, of a celestial harem up there. So it's funny, a lot of people have called Islam, pardon me, Mormonism the American Islam. There's a lot of resemblances. They both have a prophet that started it. They both have fake scripture. They both have fake revelation. And they both have this polygamy thing going on. And they both believe that heaven is basically going to be like the Playboy Club. Okay, I already talked about that. That He will have to go down and be crucified to save the people on that planet. Then there's a sociology of Mormonism. The tragedy of polygamy. Polygamy is still going on today. You probably all heard last year in the news about that, that fellow out in Utah who had five wives and they really threw the book at him. He was a fundamentalist Mormon. And there's thousands of them in Utah. Plus, it is still practiced secretly today, even within the Mormon church. I know because I was asked to take another wife, myself. Because, see, there's a lot of women. You've got to realize, women, if you join the Mormon church and you're single, you're damned. You will never get to the celestial kingdom. Because if you're not married, you're out of luck. Sorry, lady. And, and so the answer is, especially for either women who might be married, like this fellow that was, or this woman who was presented to me, her husband was a Methodist, would never join the Mormon church. He made it very clear. And the bishop came to me and said, this guy is never, this woman is never going to make it unless you want to take her on as your second wife. My first wife, Sharon, said, Pfft. you know, not surprisingly. So, you know, so I, I do believe it is still done. Plus, there are women who have come to us both before and after our salvation who told us that they had been horribly abused right up to and including clitorectomies when they would not obey the priesthood, when they would not obey the patriarchal order in Utah. Now, that's not done out here, but that kind of stuff is done in Utah and in Idaho where the Mormons are in power and they pretty much know they can get away with almost anything. Uh, Plus... Child abuse runs very high in the Mormon church, sadly enough. Uh, Also, women have no voice. They have no priesthood power. And on resurrected morning, you better watch it. Because see, here's what happens in the temple. When you go through the temple, I get my name, my secret name, that nobody knows except the president of the temple. My wife gets her secret name. But I know it. You know why I need to know it? is because the Mormons believe that on resurrected, resurrection morning, Jesus will crack the skies, and he will stand over the cemetery where I am buried, and he will say, my secret name happened to be Joseph. He will say, Joseph, come forth. And bing, up I come. And then I'm supposed to turn around to my wife and call her forth by her secret name. But if my wife burned the pot roast too many times, or if my wife was kind of a shrew, or if maybe I didn't like the way she wore her hair, And I've heard Mormon men do this. You better watch it, dear. You burn that pot roast one more time. I ain't calling you out on resurrection morning. Now, maybe they were kidding, and probably they were, but think how sexist that is. It's a kind of bondage. Utah has the highest level of teen pregnancy of any state in the Union. Families really are forever. They have unusually high teen suicide rates. You want to know why that is? They have very strict moral standards, which is fine. But any, and I repeat, any sexual sin must be confessed face-to-face to your bishop. If you masturbate, if you fornicate, if you have a homosexual encounter, if you even look at a dirty picture, you have to go and confess that to the bishop or it's not forgiven. Any sexual sin and some other serious sins have to be confessed to the bishop. And it's not even like the Catholic Church where you have to go into a little box and be anonymous. You have to stand there and face this guy, you know, who you so admire and so look up to, and blushing furiously, you have to say, I masturbated. And some of these young men, and maybe young women, they actually go out and shoot themselves. They're so embarrassed because they can't live up. See, there's no grace in the Mormon church whatsoever. And if you you are caught with any of these sins, you cannot cannot go on a mission, which is a very important kind of rite of passage, if you will, especially for Mormon young men. I mean, if you you, you go to the bishop and say, "I I have a problem with masturbation, your mission might be postponed for two or three years until you can prove that you're pure and then you can go like a couple of years without committing any kind of improprieties. So, you know, 
There's also a lot of spouse abuse because many men believe that, that they have the right to smack their women around, although uh, to the church's credit, just about the time I was leaving the church, the church leaders started speaking out against that. Gee, it only took them 150 years. Uh, a lot of women have problems with addiction, not addiction to drugs, well, addiction to drugs, but prescription drugs. Utah, in the 1970s and 80s, had the highest rate of Valium abuse of any state in the Union among women. Why do you think that is? Well, imagine this. You have 8, 9, 10, 14 children. Boom, 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 boom. One after another. You've got to be perfect all the time. You have to have this perfect Maribel Morgan smile on your face all the time. You have to be constantly available to your children, to your husband, you know, whatever, all the time. You can't ever have a problem. You know, a friend of mine who was an ex-Mormon too, he was in Idaho in a shopping center, and he saw this sweet little Mormon wife, and he knew she was Mormon because you can tell because the temple garment, you can often see it through their, their shirts or whatever. And she was standing there waiting to check out. And she had the, the perfect dress, you know, perfect. I mean, they, all Mormon women are expected to look like June Cleaver, you know, dresses, pearls, perfect hair. Except June Cleaver only had two kids. And plus she had Ward. I mean, he was a real man's man, you know. Anyway, uh, and what happened is this woman was standing there. She had an infant in the cart, a toddler beside the infant in the cart, another toddler just, it looked like they might have been twins, down on the ground next to her who was pulling on her nylons and pulling them to the point that they were shredding it. The other, there was another kid who was about three years old who was like this, and this woman was standing there, and she was trying to have this smile, and you could just see it kind of start to crack. Like at any moment, she would, you know, grab something and go postal. You know, he said he really felt sorry for her because he could tell she was trying so hard to be, to be perfect. And that's hard. To, I mean, it's hard to raise that many kids, even if you've got the Holy Spirit. Amen, women? You know, imagine if you don't. Imagine if you've got an unclean spirit. And so there's only two ways Mormon women have an out. One is chocolate. The other one is prescription drugs. And so usually you end up having either Mormon women that are chocolate addicts or a lot of them are addicted or abusing in some way psychotropic drugs with you know, the consent of their doctor, their psychiatrist. So, and they're still struggling with a race issue to this very day. A lot of Mormons are very racist. It is still believed clandestinely, they don't talk about it openly, that marrying a black person is an unpardonable sin. Um, and plus, the Mormons treat the Indians very badly. One fact, uh, the only Navajo general authority, a general authority is like a high level, kind of like a cardinal in the Catholic Church. There was a Navajo named George P. Lee who was a general authority. He was a member of the Council of Seventy. And he resigned from the church. He accused the church of spiritual genocide. Because what it was doing, see, Mormons used to teach that if a Lamanite, that is to say an Indian, became a Mormon, they would turn white. That used to be part of church doctrine, because that happens in the Book of Mormon. But since it's never happened, they kind of backed off that. But they, they would adopt Indian kids off the reservation into Mormon families, strip them of all their cultural identity, and make them be white and delightsome, even if they weren't. And this, this Lee guy got real upset with it. He ended up, he caused a big scandal in the late, in the early, I think it was the early 90s. He, he stalked out of the church, made a big mess, and he even told a friend of Ed's, Ed Decker I used to work with, um, he said he stood in the, in the room of the guy who is now the prophet of the church at the time he was second in command, and this guy looked down from his office, down into the, like a 60-story office building. And he said, he stood there like this, and he says, All the gold in this city flows through my veins, and I'm a living God. That's when he decided it was time to bug out of this thing. I mean, this guy was like a megalomaniac. Okay, politically... 
They originally experimented, the Mormons did, with what they called a united order, which was a communistic economy, which never worked very well, as we know communism never does, and they believe it will be brought back in the millennium. They believe the Constitution will hang by a thread. This is right in their scriptures. And that the elders of Israel, meaning the church priesthood leaders, will save the United States. They will be the only ones who can do it. Um, yet all LDS leaders who are 75 or 80 years old or older, in the early days when they went to the temple, one of the oaths they did is they had to promise that every single day they would call down curses upon the United States of America to avenge the blood of the prophets Joseph and Hiram Smith, who were both shot at Carthage Jail. The guy who's the current prophet did that. They have never repented of doing that. Then there was the famous Council of Yetfif. This was started by Joseph Smith. Clue, it's 50 spelled backwards. Uh, Joseph Smith started this. This is the council that crowned him king. He was crowned king of the United States. Yeah, isn't that a really clever conundrum there? Uh, and he also called this group the Illuminati. And they, he believed he was going to become king of the world, ultimately. Of course, he was shot first. Today, the Mormon church, actually in the 60s, the Mormon church, I don't know, how many of you heard of W. Cleon Skousen? Very famous constitutionalist, patriot, former FBI agent. He's a Mormon. I think he's now deceased. But he started the Freeman Institute and the National Center for Constitutional Studies. These are inner groups within the Mormon church, although non-Mormons can certainly join them, that are designed to further the political agenda of the Mormon church. Because the Mormon church believes the Constitution was inspired. Their agenda is to get a Mormon in the White House. There are many huge numbers of Mormons in the CIA and the FBI. At one time, one of four or five of the Joint Chiefs of Staff were Mormons. Many of the highest level presidential advisors have been Mormons. Um, here you see some of the significant LDS statesmen in the U.S. in the last 50 years. Uh, yeah, Orrin Hatch is a very devout Mormon. In fact, if you, if you know this, you can watch him in committee meetings on C-SPAN. He'll use his priesthood voice. Mormon leaders actually have a priesthood voice. And if you know what to listen for, you can hear it. it's kind of this mellow, authoritarian kind of voice. They want to get a Mormon in the White House. What will happen probably, in fact, they were, Mormons were hoping that Orrin Hatch would be a vice presidential candidate. They now don't think that's going to happen. And then they believe God will kill the president, and then the vice president will become president, and away we go. And he will become prophet. And he will start a theocratic kingdom in which the one mighty and strong, that's him, will reign over the whole earth. He will set up a religious dictatorship in the, United, in the United States based on the United Order. And finally, believe it or not, there's a very strange secret about the Washington Temple. This is the most extraordinary temple the church ever built. It cost $20 million in 1971 dollars. And what most people don't know is that on the top of that temple, there is a dome. Underneath that dome is a telemetry array that is exactly like what they have at the White House. On the fifth floor of that building, where no one is allowed to go except church leaders, is an exact replica of the Oval Office. An exact replica. And that is such a powerful communication center that airplanes are routed around it. It's in Bethesda, in sorry, Silver Springs, Maryland. And they believe that someday they will reign from that temple, that the President of the United States will be a Mormon prophet, and that he will rule the world with an iron fist. And he will be the one mighty and strong. And exactly, it's exactly like what's in the book of Revelations about the great beast. And they have the money to do it. They are wealthy beyond anybody's wildest dreams. I mean, right now, the Mormon church, the last I heard, is worth... It makes, it makes something like $15 million a day. That's not counting its vast holdings, its stock options. It, it owns many CBS television affiliates. It used to own Safeway. It owns Bonneville Power International. I mean, so this is something you need to watch for and take very seriously. But realize most rank-and-file Mormons just know about this in the most general way. But I happen to have a friend who was a Mormon who was in the Secret Service, and he actually told me that they have this up on the top floor of that building. So we need to take the Mormon church seriously, partly because 
they're lost and they need Jesus and partly because they have a real agenda for what they would like to do in this country. And although though they might look like real nice conservative people, and most of them are, their agenda will not be anything you will want to be a part of. So thank you for your attention. God bless. Amen. And that is uh, many videotapes that Bill has made. But, uh, you know, we've been hearing about Mormonism. We've been hearing about all of the wrong ways to do religion. So let me just, in a very brief sort of way, give you the right way. And that is the big question we have to ask here today is how do we get to heaven? So let me just ask you a question. One of the questions I really like to ask people when I'm witnessing to them and I'm trying to lead someone to the Lord. As a matter of fact, I, something just popped in my mind. I'll, so I'll tell you the incident. I had um, volunteered to go out to a prison to be with these fellas, and they were doing prison ministry. And so I went into this uh, prison, a little local prison here, and uh, they, they said, well, go on in there and sit down. So I walked into this jail cell and sat down. I mean, it's, it's pretty scary, you know. <laughs> and uh, I turned around, and they were gone, and I'm here all by myself, and a few minutes later, they appeared, and I said, man, where'd you guys go? And I said, oh, we went walking down the, the walk there, uh, inviting some of the guys in. And uh, so I, they said, well, did you get in? Yeah, we got a couple. There's one guy down there that really needs it, but he wouldn't come. And all of a sudden, this boldness came over me. Moments <laughs> earlier, I was afraid to be there, and all of a sudden, I got this boldness. So I said, well, let me go talk to him. So I walked down this walk, and I felt pretty safe because I I measured the difference between me and the wall behind me, and I thought they, there's no way they could reach their hand through and get me if I got up against that wall, so I was pretty brave behind those bars. And I walked over there, and the fellow had on an orange jumpsuit. He had it tied, the top tied around his waist, so his top was bare, and he had tattoos all over him. I mean, he looked like he just stepped down off of a Harley. Uh, Hell's Angels, not the good kind, not the Christian motorcycle, but a the Hells Angels guy, and he looked like he would slit your throat and smile about it. And so I began talking to him, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me in one of the, the most clearest ways. And I made this comment to him in our conversation. I said, you know, if you don't find true peace, one day you're going to find yourself in the middle of a field with a three fifty seven in your mouth pulling the trigger. And I said, if you want to find true peace, you come in and I'll show you how to find it. And here's what I showed the man. First of all, we have to realize that no one can go to heaven without Jesus. That all of sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. The next thing is we have to realize that uh, we cannot earn it. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 say, for it is by grace thou art saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. We cannot do anything to earn our way to heaven. We also have to understand that, that we have to do a few things to get there. So how do we get our name written into the book of life? How do we go to heaven? Romans 10, 9, and 10 gives the answer. It says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believeth in righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. In other words, it's not enough to say it and not really mean it. And it's not enough to, to mean it, really believe it, and never say it. We have to actually say it. Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But what's that word repent? We don't hear that much in America anymore. So let me explain repent. Let's say, for example, over here, this side of the podium represents holiness. And let's say over here represents down in the sand. Okay, so where we actually were when Jesus came along, we were over here. And a lot of us were enjoying it. Amen? Okay. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit came knocking on our heart. And we started realizing, hey, there's something wrong. 
We needed to get over there as holiness. But the problem is we can't get over there ourselves. We have to get there through the blood of Jesus. So what we do is we say, Jesus, come into my heart. He washes us clean. But that doesn't mean we're over here. Then we have to say, Holy Spirit, we ask you to remove the things from me that are wrong. And it's a walk. And here's the walk. We take a step, and then we slide a little bit back. And then we take a step, and then we slide a little bit back. And then we take, right? And it's a, a hard journey. Be ye holy, for I am holy. It says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In other words, just like Matthew seven twenty one says, not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of my Father. What's the will of the Father? It means that we follow his laws. We do our best to become that good kind of a Christian that we're supposed to be. We love him. We try to live a holy life. And it takes a while to get over there knowing that we can never do it. It's only by his blood. We have to hang on to his coattails into heaven. Amen? All right. You may be a Christian that has made some mistakes in the past, and now you want to clean up and you want to make certain that your name is written in the book of life. You may be someone that has never received Jesus before. But if you're in either one of those categories, matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to pray this prayer with me again. But if you're a Christian that has made some mistakes and maybe you've fallen back into the world, you pray it and ask your sins to be forgiven again. Matter of fact, I do every day. I want to make certain the blood is covering every one of them. Sometimes even a couple of times a day. And if you're one that's never prayed it before, you pray it and ask the Lord to come into your heart. Let's all pray together. Everyone bow your head, no one looking around. And even though you said it before, say it again with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I, admit I admit I'm a sinner. And I confess with my mouth. And I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father. I ask you to come into my life, wash me clean, write my name in the book of life, keep me holy, and save me the day of trouble. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you were someone that just prayed that prayer for the very first time, or if you're a Christian that prayed that prayer asking for your sins to be forgiven again, just raise your hand. I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. Okay, if you raised your hand in either group, please stand. And I have one question for you. Who's your Lord and Savior?